Hello, hello, and uh, welcome to this Story Engine deck live stream presenting the Lore Masters deck. Uh, if you have not joined us on one of these before, uh, what we've been doing this week in particular is showcasing some of the expansions for the Lore Masters deck. If you haven't heard of the Lore Masters deck yet, then you are in for a, uh, a wonderful surprise because it's a tool that we have been uh, right now promoting on Backerkit. We have a project that's live for it right now. It's a deck of cards and creative prompts for coming up with your own elements of lore and world building. Um, it's a system for creating factions and figures, events, locations, objects, materials, and creatures, and weaving them together into a big, beautiful tapestry of lore. Um, and there are some expansions that uh, sort of focus on... Um, features of world building that we didn't think needed to have a dedicated space in the main deck, but that we thought would be add so much value to the creative and world building process. Um, and uh, today in particular, we're gonna be showcasing the Namesakes expansion, which is one that I'm super excited and passionate about. Um, and uh, I'm excited to share with you. Uh, we were gonna have special guest uh, Jordan Shively joining us today, but I don't think that they're gonna be able to make it this time. Um, however, originally um, the CEO of the story engine, Maroki, who is currently uh, traveling, um, was not gonna be able to make it, uh, but I believe that she's going to be able to now beam in for us and also our our social media manager, um, Eric, or community manager, uh, who's also one of our writers, um, is going to be joining us. So I'm going to just bring them up right now. Please welcome Maroki Tong and uh, Eric. I don't know what this is. <laughs> like, I was like, this is like the Greek way of waving, apparently. It's not. This, I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, so Maroki, if you could just tell a little bit about uh, where, where you have been um, uh, and, and what you're up to at the moment, because I think that's a, a sort of fun bit of, of uh, internal lore. Yeah, the internal lore is um, exploring um, exploring the stories of Greece, per se, and uh, learning, I guess, their, what makes them tick in their backstories in economy and ecology, which one could always use for their fiction. So um, it is, I think it is 6 p.m. over here. Um, I'm about to go for a dinner around... 8.30, which means that we'll be going on till midnight, because <laughs> I have learned that when they dine in Greece, you go on for like minimum three hours. Uh, and uh, this morning, I spent time exploring the mussel farms and rice farms of the Thessaloniki area, which makes up a really big part of the agriculture. I learned that they, um, I think in that specific area alone, they grow about 8,000 tons of mussels per year, of which 90% is exported to Italy and France. And then they um, grow over 25,000 hectares of rice. It's actually a massive part of their economy. And when they had these areas of water that, um, that came in through the rivers and uh, flooded these wetlands, they weren't sure how to cultivate it because it was actually so close to the ocean. Um, the water was like these, these, these watery fields were quite salty and they're like, we can't actually grow anything here. And they're like, what about rice? And it's actually the salt. Um, they say like these salty fields uh, is what makes the rice so special. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it, you can see how there's some real life lore there when it comes to like looking at food or how like the events of the world, like apparently they actually moved one of the rivers further west because they would have blocked the ports to uh, Thessaloniki if they didn't move the rivers after World War II. So there's like a lot of really interesting real life history there. And I think inspiration that one can take yeah. uh, for their fiction. And so that's what I'm exploring. And and um, I don't know, am, am I going to become like the weird like drinks expert on this? Because I'm totally having a beer today. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you taste enough wine, you they say uh the best thing for any wine experts after day of wine have a beer and that's what i'm enjoying and you can't stop me <laughs> it is greek beer i've never had greek beer before so yes that's a little bit about my daily lore that i'm exploring i will i'll come back with um new inspirations for lore master's deck lovely well i i always love the um the number of ways that food and drink tie to world building is uh immense and varied and i always love those observations that you bring in um and i guess we should probably give eric a proper introduction um so eric is a toronto-based writer performer and media critic uh, he's currently uh, a narrative designer for emberwind from nomnivore games we are uh, very close friends of emberwind the tabletop rpg um 
uh, and he formerly served as games editor for ThatShelf.com. Uh, he's also writer, co-creator, and co-star of the stage play, uh, hashtag not all fedoras. Uh, and who's your co-writer, co-creator on that play, Eric? Uh, well, that, that would be Baroque, would be my, would be my co-creator <laughs> on that. <laughs> it's almost like we're all one big happy family or yeah. something. Yeah. But a wonderful, wonderful play exploring um, sort of gaming and geek culture and uh, the presence of tox toxic masculinity in there and all many related and relevant themes. Um, yeah, but we're very excited to have Eric join us for his first live stream. He'll also be joining us uh, for the uh, Bridge uh, expansion live stream or Bridge Expansions live stream, I should say, on Friday. So you'll be seeing him again. And and if I, if I seem a little distracted, I'm just trying to keep tabs on um, both our chat and being live now and like that little like 10 second delay that I'm used to no longer seems to be there. So. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm getting like things at different times. It's definitely an interesting, slightly more novel experience. I'll say that much. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can understand that. Well, appreciate you joining us. Appreciate you dividing your attention here um, uh, as we sort of launch into a conversation. So as has been the format of these, um, uh, looks at the expansions. We talk first about, I guess, the general themes behind the expansion. Like, why does it matter to be able to use this method of world building? And then we'll get into actually creating some stuff with it and doing a full-on demo. Um, so I guess to start us off, um, this to is start a, us off, Peter, I should say we we are starting this live rolling into three hundred and fifty thousand oh, dollars funding. Hey, I amazing. think that's how we should start yeah. this live. Thank you all so much. We gotta go update stretch goal graphics and when when this is over. We we, we um, have unlocked the full deck. <laughs> The yeah, deck is officially. Three, everyone. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Three hundred cards. Three hundred cards. This is the this was the size that felt right when I was doing the playtesting, and I really wanted to be able to get the funding to um to grow the deck from sort of the stripped down version that we had to look at for, but what's our, what's our basic funding goal? Um, yeah. So I'm I'm really excited. I've been really really wanting to hit the three hundred card count. Um, that's that's going to be twenty four hundred cues, which is more than Story Engine and Deck of Worlds combined. Um, yeah. If you haven't pledged the project already, uh, you can check it out or pledge it at storyengine slash lore That URL is up on the screen. 300 cards, 600 sides, 24 plus 100 cues, more cues than the story engine and deck of worlds combined. So you can build so much lore. So yes, um, please pledge, uh, jumping on Peter's words here. And of course, as always, do share with your friends, yep. your uh, yep. your family, your, your enemies. I, I always say the enemies bit, and I, I'm not quite... I, I believe that everyone has the opportunity to be creative, no matter who you are and whether or not you like them. You might still think Lore Master's deck is the tool for them. Yeah. Um, and speaking of Lore Master's deck, let's talk about the this Lore Mastery expansion, namesake. So um, I guess one thing I'll do to frame our conversation as we start it is talk about what the deck does and doesn't do. So the deck is not for coming up with what I would call like constructed names, where you're just combining a bunch of syllables that sound cool. So you're not going to get like the bridge at Casa Doom or <laughs> the Mines of Moria. That's not the goal here. The goal is to come up with, with nicknames that make sense in within the lore of the world, which means that somebody at some point decided to call this thing that that. Um, so some examples are like the Onion Knight from Game of Thrones uh, is a nickname uh, for, uh, oh, what's his real Sir Davos Seaworthy is his real name. Um, but uh, he um, uh, he gets that name from a little piece of lore in the backstory where he kept uh, the city alive by, he was a former smuggler, smuggling uh, onions into the city while it was under siege and everyone just ate onions to survive the siege and he ended up uh, being forgiven of his crimes as a smuggler and knighted and um, he becomes a very interesting complex character and his loyalty to the king who both raised him up and um, promoted him from basically being like a, a, a criminal to being a member of the court uh, is, is a really interesting test of loyalty. And he wears his own uh, finger bones and a bag around his neck because he, uh, when he was raised up um, uh, into this position, he's still, uh, the, the King Stannis is still very like by the books justice. He's like, the, the punishment for smuggling is, I can't pardon you for that. So we, we got to lop off your hand. That's that's the punishment, but you'll also get to be a knight. And so he wears his own finger bones and a bag around his neck. And the Onion Knight becomes this nickname that references this deeper piece of lore that makes this character feel real and complex and interesting. And that's the kind of example of a nickname that we're gonna be talking about. Oh, um, and lovely, uh, Jordan uh, is actually going to be able to join us today. Jordan, I can see you in the green room. Can you give me a little wave if you feel ready to go on? Amazing! And we're going to be adding uh, Jordan Shively to the conversation. Um, you may remember Jordan from, uh, they joined us on the um, uh, uh, Into the Heart of uh, Skycrown Glacier D&D live stream. They performed as Phaedriel Kane. Um, and uh, Jordan Shively is the author of the Dread Singles, or at Hottest Singles Twitter account. The work has also been seen in a variety of short fiction venues, such as Nightmare Magazine, 
Void Junk, um, Baffling from Neon Hemlock, and uh, various tabletop role-playing games, including uh, the Emberwind tabletop RPG, uh, something that I kept forgetting to mention on the previous live streams with Jordan, even though they were reminding me in the private chat and I just didn't see the notifications coming in. But they created uh, the Blood Mother um, for uh, the Emberwind RPG. It's so creepy and cool, really wonderful uh, monster design. Um, and you can uh, go check that out. Uh, they uh, have, oh, they've worked in the upcoming uh, Best Horror of the Year Volume 15 anthology, which is a super duper cool lineup, and uh, Jordan's work definitely belongs within it. Uh, and they live and work in Stop. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, you can find more about them at jordanshively.com. And we're super excited to have them today talking about namesakes. Um, Jordan, so just uh, to sort of catch you up here, we were, we're talking about specifically nicknames that exist in the world of the lore. So coming up with nicknames, and actually, I think a great example is um, you did a guest story for uh, the Story Engine deck anthology, uh, where you named the Cult of the Hungering Knife that has for so long <laughs> left within our site, which unfortunately is too long of a queue to fit on one card, so we can't include that in the namesakes deck. But I think it's a great example of a really lore-based nickname that brings so much with it. Um, and ask some really interesting questions about the world that this cult exists in. So uh, to start off, we were going to talk about um, what makes for an evocative title or epithet. And if you'd like to point to examples either from your work or from work that you've read or watched or enjoyed, what do you think makes for like a cool in-world nickname or epithet? It doesn't have to be for, it can be a person, it can be for a group, it can be for an object, a location, an event. Um, but what are some examples that come to mind and why you like them? Okay, that's a, a lot. Just yeah. <laughs> you like no, right no, no pressure. No, no pressure. Welcome, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Throw you into the deep end. So yeah, the example that, that I uh, just named was, was the Onion Knight from Game of Thrones, uh, who um, uh, th they smuggled onions into a city to keep the city alive, and uh, when they became knighted, that became their nickname. Uh, another example, actually, from um, a story that both uh, Maroki was a part of and Jordan was a part of, um, in the construction of um, the world of Rhymeway for our little adventure on Skycrown Glacier in that D&D live stream. Um, the uh, siblinghood of the Closed Eye being renamed um, the siblinghood of Sears uh, and also the visor of the Closed Eye, I think are examples of in-world nicknames of like, this is a, a name by which the artifact is known that is constructed using words that we all know, but that bring to it a special kind of, uh, special meaning within the world. And we actually picked that up and used that in the role play. Uh, Jordan, you had a bunch of dunks on the sibling hood, calling it like the closed eye and closed minds uh, sibling hood. Um, Roki talked about the, uh, wove this into her character talking about um, how, actually, Roki, do you wanna talk a little bit about, I guess, what the, the rebranding or the branding of the sibling hood and how that became part of using the name in the world? <laughs> well, there's the behind the scenes logic behind it, and then there's the real world logic. But um, of course, following the in world logic, the whole concept was that the siblinghood of the closed eye was notoriously bad at PR. And, uh, you know, they, they could see the truth and they could see the future, but no one would believe them because they were just so bad at communicating it to people. And, um, and then they were rebranded as siblinghood of Sears and the whole joke around it was that siblinghood of the closed eye sounded like they were extremely either like closed minded or short sighted that they couldn't indeed see they couldn't actually see the future because their eyes were closed. And like their entire logic was like, well, if our like if we close our real eye, our like third eye could open and we could see beyond but no one understood that. So then they had to, you know, rebrand a siblinghood of Sears, which they thought was incredibly boring. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's very much the. Um, I'm thinking of the. Uh, it, there's a beloved um, outdoor equipment company in Canada called Mech or Mountain Equipment Co-op, and they really um, drummed up this huge reveal for like we're rebranding after like 25 years with the same logo of these two mountain peaks. Um, we're gonna like rebrand and call it the new logo, and uh, they ended up with like a very like just like corporate square logo with just the letters M E C and like very blocky letters, and it was very like. Mech is so close to the word meh. That was generally the reaction to it because they made such a big deal out of it. Um, and um, uh, anyway, I just feel like that was that kind of like, like the siblinghood of the closed eye had this cool name that was a little bit awkward, but like they could have just stuck with it and like owned the awkwardness. And instead they tried to do a corporate <laughs> rebrand. They brought in some outside consultants and the, they just didn't fundamentally get what the siblinghood was about. <laughs> was, you know, obtuseness sometimes that's part of the brand. But yeah, examples of in-world nicknames that you like. Yeah, I think that like, um, as you've already pointed out that I think names that like are overly descriptive work really well, you know, like the knife that has so long been within our, our, our gaze or whatever I called it. Um, I think that kind of has been done a lot, but it still works really well. Like, I think if I was trying to remember like the first time I noticed someone doing that, it was probably children of the corn where 
the demon, like, I think it's only referenced like once or twice, but it's called He Who Walks Behind the Rose, you know, and the kids talk about it. So that's like its official name is like He Who Walks Behind the Rose is like really creepy because that's such a weirdly descriptive name, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan. The thing that always gets my spine tingling is when there's some kind of figure, usually like a ghost, named the Lady In or the Lady Of. Um, yeah. I, I every time there's like a Lady Of or In something, I'm always like, okay, this is gonna be this is gonna be some cool, creepy lore, and it's always got to be like an ethereal, powerful, more than human or or uh, less than human figure. Um, but that's a formula that never gets old for me. Uh, I'll always like, yeah, the Lady in Black, the Lady of the Shallows. Um, in my homebrew world for uh, a home game of D&D that I play, I have the, um, the Lady of Inbetweens, Lady of Thresholds. Who, oh, that's even like, better. Yeah. The Tide, the, the Dusk and Dawn, um, all of these periods are, are theirs. Oh, yeah, and it's like, like the, I forget what it's from, but I think I remember, like, the, the Walker of Blank, you know, like, the, the Walker of Between Worlds that come at dawn, you know. The more yeah. weirdly specific you get and the more niche you make it, I think the more interesting it is. Yeah. Very much so. I'm in full agreement there. Um, yeah, so nicheness and specificity, I think, are things we've we've called out here that that make for good or interesting names. I think length is another one. I like. Oh yeah. Name. Um, the uh, the challenge make, it, make with... it sound like a post rock song title is always yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make, make it sound like Godspeed You Black Emperor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's so interesting that you both are leaning in that direction because I, I think I've talked a lot about my enjoyment of brevity, um, perhaps as a way to kind of subvert my desire for really long things. Um, mm -hmm. So when you guys were talking about the walker, I'm reminded I did um, I did one of those like underground tunnel haunted tours when I was in Edinburgh many, many years ago. And there was this one particular ghost that they kept speaking of and his name was just the walker. And the, you know, they were saying the reason why it's called the walker is because they could hear the heavy thumping of boots um, through the underground caverns. And if you do, you hear him. And for me, that's almost like more terrifying because it's like they don't have any description. They don't have anything. They're just the thing. Yeah, and I mean, it's just obviously, so like the thing, you know, it works so it, good. So. And, and it's, it's oh, yeah, like I just, I somehow alluded to another thing right there. And, and it's always one of, it's, it is one of those things where, um, if you can get away with using that one word, it's always just more evocative because like, oh, this thing is so important that it can just be referred to by such a short title and a word that everybody uses in day-to-day -day life. It's often just harder to actually get to that point because you really need to like, the, the thing is one of the examples where it really works. Like, yep, that, that's a thing. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else we're calling that, but it is, <laughs> if, if you're coming up with something new, sometimes it is easier to start with something a little bit bigger just so you can actually figure out where you're going with it too. Yeah, because yeah, we're, we're talking about like how we can use names as like, like almost like a cheat code to yeah. giving story building. And I think things like the thing or it, you know, Jaws, you know, like they've done so much work besides that the name comes last. And it's like almost not as important because they've done so much other work in the world building and the storytelling, you know, yeah. like we're. Mm -hmm they didn't need to use a, a name as a cheat code to like give information without lore dumping. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, um, there's the implication of singularity there that this is the one you don't need to know which thing. Cause this is the thing, right? Yeah. Like there's yeah. no other thing that's more thing than this thing. Um, I think <laughs> it's the thing thing, thing, thing. And, which, which yeah. is doubly impressive because there is a comic book character called the thing and it still yeah. doesn't matter. Right. No. The thing is still no. the thing. No. Thing is still a thing. Yeah, yeah, fuck your thing. This is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, te technically the thing did come first because yeah. like the first one was like in the 40s or the 50s. It was a black yeah. and white one that came way before all the remakes. I always love finding out that there was a, an original an original version that um, is better if you have the patience for the time that it was made, but is so much less accessible because it just like movies are a lot prettier and faster paced now. I mean, um, I think no one can be carpenters though. So like, yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry, old, sorry, old fashioned thing. Yeah. Where it was like, <laughs> I have a seed that came out of my hand. Here's a seed. Now you're an alien too. You know, like, yeah, it's not okay. as good. Um, oh, quick question from the chat here. Um, we'll see both lower bridges in the bridge live stream. And the answer is yes. We're going to see there's now three. We've we've added a third. The third bridge is going to yeah. be um, the $400,000 stretch goal. 
Um, it is a bridge between Story Engine and Deck of Worlds, but we'll be, we will not be demoing that. We'll be demoing the two that we launched with um, in our lineup, which are the bridge between Lore Master's deck and Deck of Worlds and the bridge between Lore Master's deck and Story Engine deck. What a good question. I just want to shout out some of the um, people are talking about uh, other nicknames that they like here. I just added a title to my world recently. I decided one of the titles for the ruler of uh, one of the kingdoms is the Keeper of the Bright Key. He possesses a special key to a very important vault in the kingdom. And again, I think there's that's a good example of like a title that bears a role, that bears some in-world lore, and that bears singularity, right? Like they're the keeper. Um, and it makes them uh, it, it makes the role sort of feel more singular and important. And that's definitely again, I think I, I think, think it's, cheat code is such a good word for it. I think also it's important like that exact that example right there is that you can use names as um, seeds that make people wonder about things in your world. Yeah, you like sure. you, I haven't mentioned anything about this vault, nothing, but just by saying, "Oh, that guy's the keeper of the bright key," you make the reader or the game or the player wonder what the fuck is the bright key? What does it go to? Why yeah. is it so important that it's his name? You know, you don't have to, but you don't have to like throw that into the game in any other way besides this person's name to make people start asking questions. Yeah, and leaving room, I think that names are such a great example of a, a good spot to leave room for wonder. Um, I think that there's an impulse in world building and, and lore mastering where like you've done so much work on the back end, all you want to do is show all of it to people and withholding um, information and leaving room for people to wonder and also to create their own meanings is such a powerful thing to do. Um, unanswered questions are the thing that will keep people thinking about your story, thinking about your world um, and trying to come up with their own answers. And like, the, re the, the way that all of these deck systems work, like I, I, sometimes I feel like a fraud because what I've done is basically create a system where I create gaps for you to fill in, where I make you wonder how do these cards connect. Um, all the work that happens, happens in your brain. Human brains are, are pattern making machines. They're so good at connecting story and, and sequences of events and trying to make sense of them. It's just what we do with the world all the time. That's why we're, so many of us are so anxious <laughs> as we, we just, we look for patterns everywhere. And um, yeah, leaving room for your readers' brains, for your players' brains to do the pattern making. Um, is such a powerful way to get people to lean into your story. That's not a fraud, though. That's like a very long-running standard it's of writing, though. And that's what Ray Bradbury based most of his career around letting you think about what the ending actually is. You know, like he would like have a tagline and then you were supposed to like fill in what happened next, you know? If, if anything else, it's a hack. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that's like the Twilight, the Twilight Zone did that exclusively where like it'd be like ding and then you're like oh god what happened next and then you 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 would fill it in you know yeah well the whole the whole secret sauce to all of the decks is really like giving you better access to what your brain does naturally um mm -hmm. that's the that's the if there's one hack behind them that's it there you go put it all on the table um oh um, shit now everybody yeah. can just make their own cards with xerox yeah <laughs> there is there is a I mean, with our with our pdf <laughs> yeah <laughs> plug 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 i mean to be to be fair, I like, you know, one like I've, I've said this several times now, but there's a lot of words that we all get stuck on thinking. And if nothing else, Lore Master's deck expands that vocabulary and expands our way of thinking because we are pattern makers, but we got we also tend to work in the same patterns. Mm -hmm. So something like Lore Master's deck certainly disrupts those patterns and is in, and that's like what allows us to be creative or else why would we have writer's block, right? It's because we often feel like we're stuck in the, I know for me, I stop composing music the moment I'm coming up with the same cadences, the same rhythms, yeah. the same intervals over and over again, because I inherently um, will compose in certain styles that I'm comfortable with all the time. And and I need something to shake that up. And when I when I want something to shake that up, what I'll do is I'll like literally put on other music. It doesn't always help, but I'm trying to kind of change like what I'm locked in playing and what my muscle memory is. So Lore Masters deck and our other deck systems are flexing that muscle, stretching that muscle and challenging that muscle. Actually, I'm going to drop a Tom Waits quote here that I just think is so multi-creatively applicable, but he's someone who's really defied predictability in terms of like being able to pivot, doing very different styles, different albums. You talked about uh, fingers are like dogs. They always sniff the same spots. They always go to the same locations if you just let them do their thing on the instrument. Whoa. So he talked about breaking his fingers between every album. 
breaking his fingers so that he could play something new. And I think that, yeah, prompting systems, and I think Story Engine Deck does this really well, and other, other creative systems do, or other forms of prompting do too, but um, being able to break your habits, break your fingers so that you're not always reaching for the same metaphors and images, that you're forced to push that little bit harder for something that's less intuitive and that pulls you out of your comfort zone, I think can be a really powerful thing. And yeah, I, I, it's, it's a metaphor that I feel and hear when I say it, and I just love yeah. it because it really is hard to do. That's a great quote, but now you you do have to put a dollar in the Tom Waits reference jar. Oh, <laughs> shoot. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll put it. I'll put, we'll, we'll, we'll add a pledge here called the Tom Waits reference jar to um, the uh, it's one dollar. Yeah. To the back. Day. It's one dollar every time that I mentioned Tom Waits. Which is the first um, time in the whole time we've known each other that you mentioned it. But it feels like something that can can use a jar. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to talk about the jar without filling it. Um, a what, great, what uh, jar? What jar, Peter? I, I can't. I can't say, or I'm going to go bankrupt. What, what, what's the jar? <laughs> um, uh, the jar is. Hey, look, a comment. Um, uh, <laughs> I talk a lot about Stephen Kennings um, in the animal, or I think Stephen Kennings uh, in the animal nation. Uh, the new king gets renamed with the name of the god of the sky, with an unflattering title like the unaware and the unwell. This is actually one of the questions that I wanted to talk about. Is um, what does it mean? Why does it matter who came up with the name? Um, if the, if the person is named themselves or the, the thing is named itself or the name has come from the outside. And what if something has multiple names? Um, I guess, how does the origin of the name, including both like the vector, like did it come from the outside or from the inside? Um, and what is the intent of assigning a name to it? Uh, how, how, I guess, how would you use that creative game world building? Or what opportunities do you see there to come up with interesting or effective world building or lore based nicknames? I mean, especially if you have like two, two names for someone that are like opposites of each other and then you can tell immediately that it's like context and politics or like something that happens in in the world that like is forcing to have two different names that obviously like one is pro and one is negative maybe is a good way to show immediately that there's like uh friction in the society about this person yeah yeah i think it's a great i think it's a great way to put it like it, especially it, if it, you it, introduce it with one and then yeah. later on, you find out the second one, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think and I, yeah, I think being able to layer it in so you don't necessarily find out about the controversy at first. One of my favorite things in um, storytelling is when you introduce either your players in the party or in your book, you like introduce and you're kind of the assumption is that these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. Um, and as people, we, we like simple stories. So we, we, we start to default, like, I trust these people, I don't trust these people. And I love that moment where you have a chance to zoom out and realize, like, Oh, those may not have been the good guys. They just may have been some guys um, yeah. who were I was sympathetic to in the introduction, and now I'm finding out that the world is wider. There are more opinions, and like maybe they're not what they seem. I love that moment of zoom out. Yeah, of realizing it's real. Also, I'm yeah, like, like, I it thought is, this it person is Seven was Kennings, not Stephen Kennings. Seven Kennings is the title of the series, and it's not the author name. I thought for a second it was a typo of the author name, and that was me being entirely wrong about something. Apologies for that. Like all this time, I thought you were the bright lord, and now I find out you're the carrion observer. Like, I mean, this is wow. <laughs> Those are two very different things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I agree. As a source of friction of internal conflict, that's great. Being able to layer that in so they don't find that out until later is a great way to make the players re-examine or the, the readers re-examine or question what they've learned so far and who it came from. And like one, one of my favorite just questions to ask is who decides what the world means? Um, who decides what the name means or, or if this is a good or a bad thing? I love those sorts of questions. I love, I love um, the, the conceptualization of the world as a, a ideological battleground within the work itself. And I think that nicknames are such a great, again, cheat code is a great expression for it, a cheat code for getting into that. Um, yeah, which, which name should this be, thing be known by if there's competing names? And I think as a writer creator, what having a generative deck of something that, that's giving you these different myth, like, mad lib names put together can do is you get a name and then you have to make up why that name exists yeah it's like it's like okay so i put together like the the strong jaw of you know darkness it's like wow now i get to write a story or come up with why someone would, would ever be called the strong jaw of darkness you know yeah it, oh, it, I like it is, and just through one little hint like that you can come up easily i think come up with an entire fucking world and setting if you're like sitting there like oh what is this going to be about i've already done so many different things and then you're like okay so now there's number one what kind of people would even come up with this name you know yeah. all these things start coming up in your head it, it is the sort of thing where it's like a name like that immediately it's basically a question and it's a question yeah, that immediately exactly. demands an answer 
where it's like, well, you're the dragon slayer. Well, okay, which dragon? How many dragons? When were the dragons around? Did you actually yeah. kill the dragons? It's like, like there's just an immediate list of things that you immediately have to dig into in order to know who this person is. And answering questions is so much easier than coming up with something out of the, the ether, you know? Yeah, yeah. 100%. Like with, with a blank page, a question on a page is so much easier to work with than a blank page. Yes, yeah. And again, I, I, like the human brain is so much more equipped to um, uh, establish a pattern from, from something it can see than to come up with a pattern from nothing. Um, that yeah. is like a very hard thing to do. And um, instead of having some points that you can just, you know, pull a curve, that you can um, plot a curve on is something that, that, that we can do creatively a lot more easily. So it's just nice to have a little something to start with. Yeah, and a lot of times like we'll, and like, without a deck like this, this would happen like watching TV or or reading a book or something like one sentence would spark something in your head. But I think these this deck and this the end story engine and stuff is just a more proactive way of making that spark happen. It's the difference between like waiting for a spark to happen or having like a steel where you're making little sparks happen that then will start the fire of your own writing and imagination. Oh, I love that. Can we take that as a pull quote? That's Go so good. It. Love it. That is that is a great metaphor. Um, um, thank thank you for that. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one more question to the group, and then we'll pivot into war into um, actually doing some creation with nicknames. Um, and yeah, uh, so the last question that I have is kind of like it's more of a grab bag question, but um, when you're thinking about names, I guess what are some ways that you can make names more playful or interesting than just a standard kind of like high fantasy nickname? Some examples would be like comedic or ironic names, where like it's called that because it's not that. Um, or misnamed things, or like unwanted names, or like someone has a title that they don't like. Um, yeah, do you have any like other other um, fun ways, I guess, of playing with names and and going deking a little bit from the obvious and and being able to be a little bit more playful? Well, like it kind of got hinted at earlier, and I'm having trouble thinking of an example right now. But I think one of the really fun things it's like is when somebody has a given name, and I think. <sighs> In my head, and I can't think of the example, but there's like the situation where it's like the headmistress of a school has a name, but then all the students have an inversion of that name. Yeah. So it's like they're just they're just tweaking it. It, it, it it's like instead of headmistress, head witch. It's just like like and that's a pretty bad example. But um, just oh, that yeah, idea yeah. Where, where 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 it's like there's the um the thing that's the official title, and then the little dig that all the people around um around them try to like kind of cut in there like say under their breath as they're passing so yeah. you, you can kind of like have like one name like two names for the same person and that tells you a lot about who they are and their relationship to everybody else around them in your story yeah and i think that's a great if you do that you have to like check off's gun that and have someone accidentally uh in a moment of like uh distraction or frustration call them that to their face and then deal with the consequences of it um, but it's a great example of like how yeah, which name you use for someone demonstrates which in group you belong to, right? Or which faction? Like it becomes an identifier. Can, it doesn't always have to be like a, an obvious negative. It can be that the person has a very like good, nice name that they don't want, like because they don't want to live up to it, you know, Ooh, kind of thing. You that's know, a cool. That's a very cool idea. Yeah. It's like no, don't call me he who will open all doors and bind all demons because I I, I I'm a farmer. And I don't want to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's, a, that's such a good um, disruption of trope. I love that. A uh, great example here from Forrester's Misconceptions. The crab eater seals have weird teeth, but they don't actually eat seals. Um, Forrest is, Drew, that we've seen. It's a good point. Maybe it's I, like I, a secret snack in the depths. Yeah. They only eat it in the depths. Secret snack. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm also I'm also enjoying the uh, Lil John as a, as a reference, especially as like um, you think back to Mel Brooks and... Um, men in tights where it's like don't let the name fool you i'm actually quite large <laughs> yeah 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 and, and it's, yeah, and it's I, I, such a great joke over explained but it, it does tell you a lot <laughs> yeah yeah and any I, I i love ironic nicknames um and a great example here from fellowship of the tables names are on the, that are on the nose can be fun too i have a dnd character named brick because he's dumb as one i have written a character named brick who is just a very blunt character um i have, I have a <laughs> I'm a big fan of um. I actually, uh, in, for writing for Emberwind, I I had characters. Uh, I wanted to name characters. I, I think I got. I, I was told I could not name a character Buttons, but I got to name them Boots instead. Ooh, Buttons um, is a great name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'm a big fan of like words that are simple physical objects as names. Um, yeah, I wanted for a while. I like, and you can steal this idea, everyone watching, if you want. I want to write a module about um kobolds who all serve like a book dragon but then all their names are like french flap 
Oh, in, I like, love that. Dog ear yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Like they all had like book related Recto, names. Recto Verso. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, Recto um, and Verso have to be twins. In 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 Dice is like was like the shaman, you know, like yeah. <laughs> absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's um, it's less about. It, I feel like this is like a very. It, it blurs the line between nicknames and how jargon exists in the English language nowadays. But when I refer to certain people in my life, uh, and I if I say bro versus brother, I, I I think like it has a very specific connotation of how I refer to that person, and like that's why I feel like it's a it's a it, it might be a jargon thing, but at the same time like. That's how we assign nicknames to people. Like in in Chinese, we call a lot of people by their nicknames, especially in the family. Like we all have, like I'm called like you know big sister, and it's actually not just like calling someone big sister. It's like very much like an almost an honorific, where and like my third sister is called third sister, and they assign that to people um, within our culture a lot. And so sometimes I feel like similarly, you know, when I call someone like if I you know. Uh, if, if, if like, if I, if I call someone like my friend and I like, just write like F R I E N, it has a very different connotation than saying my friend, right? Like it's, it, it, we assign a very different meaning versus, you know, one sounding a lot more formalized and that friendship, I don't know, has a weightiness to it. Or like my friend, it's like, you could be my close friend or you could just be like an acquaintance, but I'm, I'm lighthearting and making it seem like that we have some sort of relationship to each other. Yeah, and, and even like who uses a formal title when addressing someone and who uses their, their personal name or a nickname is really interesting. And then when those when when um those honorifics become someone's nickname, like I know something that's that's very common uh, in, in Tagalog and Filipino families is Ate for older sister, Koya for older brother, these these sort of terms of respect. But um you'll often see people who aren't in the family call like just a, a woman who sort of has that um older sister role, Ate. Um and, and sometimes yeah. that just becomes kind of like the, the not the name they go by but more people will call them that than by their first name um and uh, yeah so it becomes this entanglement of different cultural values of of the cultural value of like age and respect of of the role of an elder even if someone isn't necessarily older but they, they fill that role it can be it, it can involve endearment as well as respect like the way that all those things come together in an honorific is it's really interesting for sure yeah and i i think and like in chinese culture is the same thing and in fact like we tend to call most you know women or, or men like in other families if they're family friends or whatnot, you call them auntie and it's considered a sign of respect. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're related them to them or not, but you call them auntie. And, uh, and I guess like that is a form of nicknames, even though they're not a direct name. Um, but we, we play on that. But when you were talking about name names, right, we play on that, whether you shorten someone's name, you know, it's like calling you Pete would carry a very different energy than Peter. Yeah. And we all choose those names for a specific reason. I actually have this memory of this. There was this fellow, he was a musician. He, I guess he still is a musician. And um, his name is Brockenshire. And wow. I remember, yeah. yeah, his name is Brockenshire. And I remember we were all. He sounds like he invented an out. instrument. Yeah, he invented the Brockenspiel <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we were all hanging out and just like without thinking, I was like, oh, and like Brock over here, so-and-so. And he like looks at me and he's like, it's Brockenshire. Oh. And I was like. I was like, "All right, okay. Your, the, your name does not get shortened because clearly there's a you're a, you put you into a category of douchebag too." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in that moment, I didn't say anything. I might have thought of it a little yeah. bit, but but I also understand that there's some people who like will refuse to be to have their name shortened or lengthened or whatever because it that name means something so significant to them. And uh, that's like important to know when it comes to names as well. And we make we make a lot of commentary around that too. Yeah, and I think um, something we can think about as we're doing the world building. I think we won't we can do this through creation rather than through discussion. But um, uh, worlds in which the power of names means something uh, magical or cultural, but like the power to name something or the power to know something and call it by its name. Um, really, really fun to play with. And I want to just sort of keep that in our mind as we pivot into the creative process here. Yeah, that's Murky, exactly I... what I was thinking about. Like, I was thinking about like names that are names that you can't say, 
in that ma- in the name is not saying the name. Right. You yeah. know, is like a, a cool thing. Like, you know. Ursi did a lot of that, right? Like, Ur- like their wizard, they always had like the true name and they never give out their real name because name has, like names have power. And I think a, f- a few other kind of magical yeah. fantasy. A- Aragon uh, did it, it was probably that. derived from Earthsea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there yeah. we go i've never read aragon i i'm guilty to say so yeah Beautiful. well um let's let's pivot into a little bit of the creative process here murky i know it's very late for you um so if you want a chance to to exit here uh, and say uh, farewell to the folks and we can pivot into creation but um thank you so much for yes. uh yeah sharing your perspectives on naming and in particular on sort of the the um chinese cultural traditions with those uh, familial nicknames so i think it's a very cool element yeah for there. sure and i have a have an amazing creative time it's not too late over here but it will go late tonight because i still have a dinner to prepare for like i said the 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 three and a half hour greek dinner full greek style and um oh, it is no, like 40 plus or for you eating a full <laughs> greek dinner oh. there's a lot of networking involved and i've been i i literally have been in the sun in like 40 degree celsius weather for hours today at this point um looking at mussel farms and rice farms jordan so cut me a little bit of slack here oh no i was like oh man i want a greek, a greek which greek. way which way to the mussel farm which way to the mussel farm <laughs> oh, <laughs> over there <laughs> I actually don't know. There are no muscle farms in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maroki. Um, uh, we will catch you, I think, in next week's live streams talking about uh, tabletop RPG settings. Or, oh, no, actually, you, you were going to join us for Friday for the bridge expansions. Is that right? No, I, I no? won't oh, okay. be around. I, I, I think you're just getting me on Friday. <laughs> just, okay. Then it'll be me and Eric hanging out. It'll be a good time. And Maroki will catch you next week. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Have an amazing time, you guys. I look forward to Thank seeing you. what you guys all create in the, uh, in the video on demand afterwards. Yes, yeah. you can catch everything on demand if you missed the live stream today. That's yeah. my little shout out for that. Because that's what I'll be li- catching. Yeah, I think we're just literally YouTube slash at Story Engine Deck. And then you can click our little live tab, all the replays, including the replay of... Um, actually, I think we just hit 500 views on um, the uh, our little Glacier one-shot adventure. So thank you, everyone, who's tuned oh, in to catch that. And also, uh, we I- apologize to you all who watched that. Yeah. <laughs> no apologies. There's no, no apologies. Never no surrender. <laughs> it's a great story. All right. Okay. Have a good one, guys. Bye. All right. So I'm going to pull up our little um, demo cam and I'm going to see if I can get us to. Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a little name based uh, world building. Um, and so, talk a little bit about the Namesakes deck. So, the Namesake deck takes the same form as the Wild Cards in uh, the Lore Masters deck. So, Wild Cards are uh, usually they're not part of the first prompt you drew. They're, they're a card that you draw as the first card for a, a second prompt that you're laying down and connecting as you're starting to build out your lore web. Um, and uh, the namesake cards look like this, and they replace those um, regular wild cards. So, rather than it being. Um, a little um, one word. Oh, yeah, I pulled this. Sorry, horny is specifically one that I put in for animals, yeah. by the way, but I think it's really <laughs> funny when you apply it to humans. Um, so uh, just I, 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 I do not believe that you thought that was going to be used for animals. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> it, it, there's it, no I, way. I, I, I believe no I probably should have known better. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's specifically there to facilitate um, the uh, fan fiction of Fadriel and Nam, um, yeah, yeah. Character and Maroki's character from the One Shot Adventure. That's specifically there to facilitate uh, fan fiction. But yeah, so this is a regular. Um, oh man, we got to connect uh, frantic and horny somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I somehow I don't think that's going to be that hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll find a way. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, honestly, all I'm really thinking of is just like one of those like very tiny dogs that just humps everything. <laughs> life <laughs> yeah yeah definitely has that energy but yeah so here's a regular wild card uh the main difference is um for so for namesakes we handpicked adjectives that feel like they're part of these of, like appellations of um and that's a p p l e l a t i o n s not like the mountain range um appellations like names or, or naming formations uh so we, we handpicked and cherry picked those so all of these cues are different from the ones in um the uh, wild card, the uh, main deck's wild cards. You can tell the difference between them because we use the namesake icon from the deck of worlds for the namesake based wild cards, and we use the um, aspect icon from story engine deck for sort of these simple descriptors that follow very much the same format of aspects from the story engine deck. All the cards are double sided, so you pick between eight different options. Um, and the uh, rather than the two arrows that indicate the way that your lore connections are flowing, we have a single arrow inside of a little box that represents the card that it's connected to. So this actually shows you the formula for like. Does this come before or after the word? You can ignore, ignore that if you want to, but it's just meant to help you quickly put together, oh, this one comes after. It's going to be the blank of the ancients. This one comes before. It's going to be the forgotten 
blank. And that's just a really quick way to be able to read the cards easily. Is yeah, there an sure. underprint of a design or am I going crazy? There is an underprint of a design at okay, yeah. like 5% saturation. <laughs> I think we're going to bump it up for the final print, um, but we decided not to switch templates mid, uh, mid, mid alpha. No, it's cool. I like that. It's really subtle. It's a nice, nice little, uh, it's the flower from the logo. Okay. The, there, there's, the actually, there's actually no design there. I don't know what you're talking about. No, yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. That's all gaslight, what Jordan. What design, Jordan? <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Um, you know, yeah, all you the teeth, the... all, the, all like the, the mounds of teeth you can see behind yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't you all see, yeah, yeah. Can't you all see the man um, that you see in your dreams, but he's on this card just in the background. Yeah, the one with the burnt, out, the burnt out face who's pointing yeah. at me. Yeah, that I one. can see yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I can't. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and the other thing is, normally you'll draw this, uh, like I said, for the first card in the second prompt, but we're going to bang things off today by using these because we want a chance to dive in and, and really enjoy um, the namesake cards. So I'm going to shuffle up our namesake deck here, and uh, we'll start with a prompt. Uh, in the chat, can you vote for if we want to come up with a nickname for um, a faction, a figure, a event, a location, an object, a material, or a creature? Those are the seven card types. You can also see them if you just visit the main page. We list them out. But uh, go ahead and vote in the chat for are we going to create a faction, a figure, a event, a location, an object, a material, or a creature. All right. We've got figure, creature, creature. People, people want to make a horny creature. <laughs> people have spoken. Object, I mean, it's, it's very faction. on topic with the, re the upcoming release of Baldur's Gate 3. So, you know. Yeah, I've been. I was playing the um, uh, the beta version with a friend, um, and um, fun, fun little game. Fun little game. I like it. Yeah, I like it. It's a, a very bear of a game. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just realized <laughs> where you're going with this. Yeah, um, there's a detail about something, an activity that you can do in the game um, that is part of many other games, but in this game, you can do it wild shaped as a bear. Um, so I guess what, what we'll leave that as. Um, okay, so uh, we've got votes for figure, creature, creature, faction, object, creature. That's three for creatures. So let's start by naming a creature. So first card we're going to draw is a creature card. Um, so the way that uh, this works, Jordan and Eric, because I think your first time doing a live prompt with us, usually what we do is I'll draw the card, I'll read out the prompts, and then we will um, the, the chat will vote, but we will try and sway democracy by pitching ideas for how we would read or interpret the cues. Okay. And then we, we honor the chat's vote. Occasionally, if we get really excited, we'll override the chat and, and go with a, a choice that one of us has pitched. Um, and sometimes I'll just do a quick round where one of you just gets to make the decision on your own without the chat and um, it'll keep things moving. So here we go. Um, are we going to create the, a bug, a salamander, a plant, or a rhinoceros? Bug, duh. <laughs> I like bug because if we're doing a nickname, like the nicknames are designed often to go grandiose, but the idea that it's like the scintillating bug, I really like that <laughs> mismatch in tone. So I, I definitely am a fan of bug here. Eric, it, it, it feels like there's already so like I, I suppose that's what the prompts are for. There's only so many directions you're gonna end up going with rhinoceros. <laughs> yeah, but like it, it's always fun to like pick the one where you're like I don't know where that's going, and then to have to figure it out. Um, yeah, or have although, it be although like I suppose the, if, if opposite wanted to be, of what if we wanted to be is. horny, rhino's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, the, the horny rhinoceros is like literally a little on the nose. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Um, all right, plant, 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 salamander. I'm sorry, bug. We're gonna plants. Plant plants, good plant. too. Yeah. I love some. I love some creepy mush. Some creepy plants. All right, so let's go ahead with. Uh, is this plant going to be the velvet plant? The horny <laughs> plant. Oh wow, the shuffle brought horny right back. The plant of the ancients. The forgotten plant. The frantic plant. The joyful plant. Nah. The scattered plant. <laughs> Ooh, the illuminated plant. I kind of like as a little nickname. I, I love I bioluminescence. I will never get tired of making things bioluminescent, and I like the idea of a little illuminated plant. I, I'm here? actually curious about the scattered plant. Um, I was thinking like, that's kind of a cool like for like a dandelion type thing. Uh, even even like even like a fungus type thing. It's like you hear about those like mm -hmm. mushrooms that are, like go a yeah. mile underground. Like, what does scattered mean, or is it actually like separate, discrete plants that are somehow still one organism? So it's like like are they're all it's all these spores that somehow communicate with each other to kind of exist as a single thing. I um, like I like forgotten too, because I'm like, just why is it forgotten? Did the plant make you forget it? Is the plant actually all around us all the time, but we can't remember it because it's oh, making us forget? That's really cool. I really like that. We, we have a lot of votes for of the ancients. 
All right. Well, we'll, we'll honor the chat here. The, with the, the obvious one. The plant of the ancients. But we can we can work with this. We can work with this. We can uh, figure out um, from the rest of the cues what that means um, and why that's interesting. Come on, plant chat. of the ancients. Um, okay. Here we go. So now we're going to draw some more. So. Um, Again, for those who have not yet seen the Lore Masters deck, the Lore Masters deck is a deck of cards for coming up with original world building ideas for your lore. You can create factions, figures. Like I've done this list so many times. Factions, figures, <laughs> events, locations, objects, materials, and creatures with it. Um, we are demoing the Namesakes expansion right now. Um, if you want to check it out, you can check it out or pledge it at uh, storyenginedeck.com slash lore. Um, and uh, all of the cards are double-sided. So after you've taken, taken your primary draw, which is the colorful side, where you can see the background element a lot more clearly, um, uh, you'll instead draw secondary cues, where you use the cues in the back, and we'll decide one of these things to apply to our main card here. So our plant of the ancients, um, does it have a background where it's an invasive species in a specific location? And we draw another location card to determine what location that is. Does it have a trait where it is a crystalline body? It's kind of cool. Always love a good crystalline body. A trait where uh, it is complex social groupings, which would be interesting to, because the thing is we didn't use the scattered plant, but we can still fold that idea into our world building. Like there's no reason that a cue that doesn't show up in the final prompt can't be used as flavor or, or part of what you, what you do here. Uh, and then trait where it has multiple eyes, ears, or mouths, which is a very Jordan Shively, uh, yeah. <laughs> very Jordan Shively flavor. I, I actually do like the crystalline body for something that's called yeah. the ancients, where it's like you it's already got this like calcification that's settled over time, like, like it's an old thing. And, it's, it's had... and Crystal immediately also kind of connotes that it, there's a possibility that it's storing information inside of it as like a yeah. Re repository. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's such a cool idea. And um, we have all, yeah, all the notes are coming in Crystal in here. Um, I think it's cool. Yeah, I also like, like the idea that it's, yeah, it's a calcified plant or like a petrified plant. Like, like it's almost like a second form of life that it takes on after it's undergone the petrification process. Um, I mean, it's obviously where all the ghosts are stored inside of the crystal. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, Duh. yes, yes. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but, that, that, but that makes sense because like it, it is a thing that has a kind of basic biological framework. So like it, in terms of like having a place to stuff a soul, it, it is a soul shaped container, right? Like it, it and, and all, all the, the, the branches and leaves are basically like the schematic of a computer with, with its crystalline. So it's like all the storage where the souls are kept. Oh, well, I love it. like like, and then now the question, and now the question is like, is it actually doing that, or is it what the people believe about it? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who decides what? Who decides what the world means? Um, my favorite question to ask in world building, and I think that's a great example of yeah. Um, uh, that's why I, I'm a big fan of avoiding God's eye world building. We are like, this is the way the world is. I love when everything we know about the world is reported through someone that we may not trust. Um, or may or not that, be smart. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, 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 or is, it, is it things about the world that that person literally does not know? Have they actually discovered yeah. any of that yet? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Because that's, you know, the, the real world is confusing and finding sources that we trust is very hard and there's conflicting views on everything. No reason that fictional worlds should be any different. Uh, another prompt here. Um, trait uh, that this um, plant bears single offspring or lays a single egg. I love the idea of a plant that like reproduces through something more egg-like instead of seed-like. A trait where it's partly mechanical or synthetic, which we kind of already have going on yeah. with the crystal here. Um, a background where it is the pet of a notable figure. So an, we'll, we'll create a figure in the world who like keeps one of these plants in their home or in their um, stronghold. Uh, a trait where the plant has feathers or scales. Ooh, I like all of these. I like pet or egg. I I, th I think pet of a notable figure is good too with the of the ancients name because it doesn't actually have to be somebody who lives in our world contemporary at the moment. It's like like there's like a myth or a legend about somebody. Yeah, yeah. Who so kept one of these plants, and so it's like this, this like god or king or or, or royal f some kind of figure had one of these things. Yeah, and, and that's and why it has the connotations it does now. And on the other side, you can be like, what kind? If it's someone who, who now has this, then the, like, what kind of person on purpose keeps a crystalline plant of ghosts as a pet? You know, what does that yeah. say about that person? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely a choice. Um, okay, so I think we're gonna go with pet of a notable figure based on the votes there. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and draw a figure card right now to figure out who that figure is. Figure out. Ah, accidental pun. Just because words mean two things sometimes. Um, all right. Is the figure, the notable figure who uh, owned this uh, as a pet, are they a socialist, <laughs> a soldier, an arcanist, very different kind of ist, or a designer? 
What are we thinking? I mean, I think it had. I mean, to me, it would be Arcanist. But socialist, uh, yeah. socialist would be really interesting. There's also a case for designer too. It's like you think about as somebody who probably watches too too much reality TV on occasion. It's like some of the like like you look at like the way fashion will draw inspiration from like things in the natural world. So it's like having this visual reference is like, does this influence the way people dress or like, like, like certain styles um, plants like have a very distinct texture. Oh, and are there just, there's like, Oh, I just really wanted to brighten up the room so that the, the soft sides of the di of the dead really bring a certain <laughs> genetic part of the room. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and and every time they relive their tortures, it, it pulses and lights up. It's so beautiful. This is the second time, um, Jordan, that you've you've uh, just nailed a joke like this. I just want to call out. I was rewatching. I, I had to put in um, chapter timestamps in our D and D one shot live play, and there's a, the moment where you uh, named Leonard, who became a very important figure in the story. Leonard is the houseplant who ended up kind of becoming the crux of, of the story in many ways. And you named this one's Leonard, and then uh, my wife Jasmine, playing as Amaril, replied like, "Oh, that's so sweet." And then Phaedriel adds. They say their names as they scream and die. <laughs> and, and, and like, oh, it's worse the more you find out. <laughs> and that back and forth between the two of you is just such a golden role play moment. Um, my wife hates it when I do chef's kisses, uh, which only makes me do them more. Yes. Uh, but I just want to call it, it such a good moment. Um, the naming of Leonard, really crucial in the story, part of your, your short rest around the middle of the campaign. That's great. Well, I mean, it's so easy to do that when the other person, like your wife, is giving good comebacks too, you know? Oh, my wife dunks on me constantly. <laughs> yeah, um, which, which made, made, it so, made it so easy to have jokes because you're getting set up by someone. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and again, it was my, my wife's first time doing a live play. She started playing D&D &D a year ago. Did it and I just so good. It. It's so Seemed good. like they were, they were a streamer who had been doing it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that she could have had a career in, in improv comedy. But you didn't come here to hear me gush about my wife. That's just <laughs> a little side benefit. Um, so uh, let's count the votes here. Um, we've got Arcanist, Arcanist, Designer, changing Arcanist to Designer. So it's two for Designer. So yeah, we got a Designer here um, as our figure. And let's get one more. And what going. does Designer mean? You know? Hmm. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's, a, there's a lot of things that get yeah. designed in this world. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the the um, patting myself on the back. One of the things that I spend a lot of time doing with the cards is balancing out narrow prompts and broad prompts. So every card has at least one option that you can read a lot of different things into it, and every option is one where like if you're not a if you don't want to have to do that kind of thinking and you just want something that like kind of comes wholly ready to use, there's always something specific like that. An arcanist is pretty pretty narrow, for example. Yeah, but um, designer man, like what if he's designing like new ghost bodies, you know? And this is like his his like little like his inspo board, you know? Yeah, like he got, he's like got so bored of like standard phylactery, and so he's like, I'm gonna do something different. I want to do like bonsai phylactery, yeah. and then this. I'm tired of fusing all these stolen bodies together in the same old way. I'm gonna look at this other <laughs> crystal thing now. I'm tired of meat and blood. <laughs> it, it, you you like, sound like Fadriel. Like, <laughs> it's, it's like oh, Frankenstein thought he was so impressive, but he I'm stitching ghosts together. I can't yeah, even yeah. use physical thread. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's a really cool question too, right? Like, what, what is I'm, the physical I'm like handling of the edge physical cutting like? edge? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds. That sounds like a um, post-hardcore uh, song. Yeah. Title. All right. Last prompt here for um, or last cue that we're going to choose for our plant uh, background where it naturally produces a material. <laughs> Gross. A trait where it's notably hairy or hairless. Um, a trait where it has a polar or desert habitat, or a trait where it has a very slow or fast metabolism. I mean, the crystal has to have hair, I think. <laughs> a hairy crystal? Well, I'm thinking about like, like, um, like you know, when you see like a fine, fine close up picture of mm -hmm. an ant, uh, it's like it has a very gleamy body, but when you look close, it actually is like covered in hairs. I think it'd be cool if like the crystal had this like weird spiky outer lattice or like protection. And that's how it interacts with like, like you touch oh, it yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, suddenly yeah. it's like, it, it's like, ah, and like, oh, you're in the crystal now. You yeah, know, yeah, like... yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be like a needle for like poking in, and then also yeah. it could be like 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 little like data point, like you know, like all the little contact points on a charger for like your cell phone. Yeah, that, that's the contact the, points. Yeah. That's the USB interface. Is yeah, the, when you put you touch it and it like goes into your hand. Yeah, and every time you try to put a sole in, you're like, oh, is it upside down? No, it was right side up. Why isn't yeah. it? Yeah, there's yeah. that moment of of which way is up for a sole. Love it. Uh, three votes for material. I think. Um, 
I think we've got material. Also, yeah, let's call that back for a lol on um, the uh, Pinterest board of souls. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Love that image. Okay. So we'll pull our material. Um, we're going to pick, uh, so you can see there's two icons for material types. So we're going to draw two material cards and pick our favorite of the eight prompts. Um, and generally speaking, when egg, there's an indicator, egg, 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 egg. egg. <laughs> generally speaking, when there's when there's the two um, uh, the two icons, it means you draw two. But usually, because this is a bit of a narrow fit, and making it work might require a few extra options. So that's just a little design note on why we do that. Okay, so eight choices here. Um, does it produce an oil, a yes. string, <laughs> a steel, a textile? Oh, okay. Oil, I guess oil. We're going with oil. Um, a polish. Does it produce cables? Oh, come on. Ooh, cables Tendrils are good. that are like cables. Yeah. Pretty, Cable, pretty, pretty. Cables cool. are good. Uh, gold or salt? I like oil and cables. I like oil and cables. And we can always just double tuck, right? Like we can um, put that there. Yeah. Like, like if the cables are it's, full it's of a, a fluid. I think cables, it's a very useful cables, plant if that's the case. This, 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 yeah. this, this thing is like, this thing is like hemp and a sperm whale all in one. Well, I'm starting to think of it looking a bit like the squiddies from the matrix, like, like these kind of crystalline uh, eyes or like ports, but then also like gleaming metal cables coming out of it, little contact points. If you, you imagine that if like you cut it, it would suddenly like spurt this oil that is the fluid that's running inside it. I'm starting to get very much, and maybe it's just because. See, it's to me, it's like all like crystalline, maybe going up the side of the room, but then like out of these little ports, like basically what it would look like if you took a spinal cord away and just had the nerves comes out of it, like oh, listening right, right. nerve tendrils. Yeah, 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 I'm definitely thinking just like like, like vines and um like, like thick jungle ropes, basically or jungle vines that you can kind of like, like swing up, but that have this like fluid in them if you do cut them open where like when i hear cables it's like i think like that that kind of like tensile strength and they yeah. obviously just like go down your throat to interact with you yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah obviously well yeah, yeah. i mean also I your eyes and your ears like they kind of like just encapsulate your head love it i absolutely love it and let's uh let's tuck those in and the right. oil maybe then you produce the oil when that's happened <laughs> We got enough votes for cables, and I think we're going to force oil in because we all like it. Um, and uh, that's not an innuendo. Um, okay, the oil so... is like on your soul after you use it. Oh, I like the idea. Yeah, that it, like it leaves a metaphysical stain. I think yeah. there's a lot you can do with inside that. of you. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So that's that's we've got a complete prompt here. So no, next... people who use the the crystal plant too much, like it's in their eyes, kind of like the the black oil in X Files. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's how you tell um, someone in society who has been touching the plant a lot. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I like that that can mean a variety of things. Yeah. Um, but most of them are, like, questionable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. All right, so we have a complete prompt. Um, I'm going to pull this over just to the side so we can see it a little bit better. Um, and uh, we're not uh, getting into the um, zone where our little faces are showing up on the screen here. And uh, we are now going to, um, Jordan, I'm gonna make this your call. Do you want to expand and learn more about this designer or do you want to expand and learn more about the uh, oiled cable materials? Because um, uh, we'll expand one of those and build a prompt around that now to learn more about it. Uh, designer. All right, let's find out about this designer who uh, had one of these as a pet. It seems like we're vibing that this person either like invented or or pioneered or in some way changed or modified this organism. I, I like that we're working with that. So here's an example of, of how I feel um, like he worships it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, But you you love a good like um, yeah, you love a good like uh, thrall. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, call a note. Our special guests. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, we're going to pick between these eight options for our designer. Um, they are the brash. They're known as the brash designer, the loyal designer, the designer of the dragonfly, which would be a very that keeps showing one. up. Yeah, I love dragonflies. I think I may have over deployed them, um, so that one may end up getting pulled from the deck. Um, this is I'm in the explosive write as many cues as you want phase, and then the edit back phase isn't, has not uh, happened yet. Um, the gleaming designer, um, the brash designer we already had, the scavengers designer. Mm. The common designer, the vicious designer, or the unyielding designer. I like gleaming and scavengers. I, I love scavengers, um, especially because that, that that's a thing that I think makes a ton of sense for a plant. It, like like, like uh, it's forage. It's um, mm. you, you, it's something that you stumble across in the woods, and so it's like like it has that um, discovered sense. Yeah, I think. 
Yeah, I like I like scavengers, and I like um I like the idea that it gives us some information about like how they design or what they use if they're using scavenged or salvaged materials. Um, rather than I was imagining a much more like clinical scientific thing, but all of a sudden you get more of the like Frankenstein's monster like stitches and things thrown together that just happen to be around. And then you uh, get the whole like ability to be like to add like a fuck around and found out kind of thing to the story. It's like how did you scavenge too far and too deep? And then you found this thing that you probably shouldn't have found. Yeah. Well, well, well it's, and, and, and getting getting back to like 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 souls living in this thing where it's like you first found it, it's like oh crap, there's actually something here. It, you, you stumble across it, but then it actually has the ability to exert influence back at you. And when did, you first you found it, it, when you first did, found did, it, it had no souls. It just wanted them. Did, did you find it or did it find you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It definitely yeah. found you. Well, one of my favorite um, sort of thought experiments is, is questioning whether or not we um, cultivated and domesticated plants or if plants cultivated and domesticated us. Uh, they rewarded behaviors by which we made a lot of them grow and have successfully, you know, uh, taken over like, like crops, basically. Crops uh, ha have a very interesting evolutionary strategy for having convinced us to cover the planet in them. Um, uh, yeah, who, who is cultivating who um, is a very interesting question. And I love that for these little soul plants. Love it. Um, okay, so we've got uh, votes for Vicious, Unyielding, and Scavenger. And I think we all voted for Scavenger. So let's go with that. We'll, we'll be the tiebreaker on the vote here. So uh, when you are expanding a prompt, just a little deck use note, um, you are going to uh, position your wild cards that the arrow is pointing from the origin of the connection to the recipient of the connection. And uh, when you're looking at primary prompts, um, which are these cards that are in the center and are colored, um, it is the prompt that is facing you on the bottom that is active. So I'm going to actually get rid of our little banner here for a moment um, so that we can see that. So uh, this is the plant of the ancients. Plant is our active cube. It's facing us. The designer is the active cube because it's facing us. And it's the scavenger's designer. And that arrow connects this card to this card. So that's just sort of the visual uh, schematic of how the cards connect mm -hmm. to each other. Um, if you find the extra text around the edges distracting, you're like, oh, scavenger socialist. I thought we didn't use socialist. That's why we have the um, the focus sleeves, which are sleeves that cover the unused cues that you just see the one that you're using and make it a little bit easier to like not be visually overwhelmed by information. Well, that's Optional add-on. Cool. Yeah, it was Maroki had suggested it because it can be confusing the first few times using the deck to like just visually parse. All oh, right, which of these words am I so using? So is it a sleeve that has like a cutout that yep. like yeah, yeah. basically. That's yeah, I'll, rad. it's a little it's a little keyhole shaped cutter. I'll I'll pull it up. Um, we we pulled it up in the last stream, and it was it helped for people to be able to visualize it. So just give me a moment here. I just like um, when things are cut out of things. Yeah, me too. I also I love keyhole shapes. <laughs> when when, 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 when shapes organs are cut out of bodies, when <laughs> no, I'm at paper, but you know organs. Maybe your organs are made out of paper. Who knows? All right, give me a moment here. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Boop. There we go. Um, so yeah, they oh, look like this. an actual keyhole. Okay. Yeah, so it's shaped like kind of like a little keyhole flare, cool. or like a train coming at you with a headlight on, depending. on Actually, yeah. Now that you mention it, I hadn't thought about that at first, but I, I like there's some very 1920s film vibes going on right now. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I have to run away from the screen of the train. But it makes sense though, because I wasn't even thinking about you needing to have the circle in the middle. You know. Yeah, but it's it's nice to have that just because it reminds like you have the, the strict mm -hmm. label and the icon of the yeah. card types. So you know what materials you're working with. So yeah, those that's a that's an add-on. Um, if you end up wanting that, they're they're custom printed sleeves. Or just, you don't need a lot of them because you don't need to sleeve every card. You just when you pick your queue, sleeve yeah. it with that queue showing and move on. So you only so need to buy at least twenty or thirty of them. I, yeah. People are talking about yeah. buying multiple packs, and I'm gonna like at the risk of like d discouraging <laughs> people from adding on things. I think that you need one. I think that one. Oh yeah. Is fine. Okay. I just read. It. If it's sixty sleeves, yes, you just uh, yeah. need one. Good. One. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you I mean, I, I, I mean, if, if, if your bliss is putting this on all your cards and having them all look nice in your in your thing, then yeah, go for it. Look, yeah. and, and if somebody's if somebody's really going to commit to it, it's like like maybe like two years from now, we just got a photo sent to us from somebody who's like covered an entire courtyard in a giant mole <laughs> rub and taken a photo from the roof next to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is it, yeah, and like it depends on how 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 basically big and active you want your prompts, or if like you save some of your prompts and leave them out so that you can use them. Um, but we figured sixty was a good a good number. Peter, good at, good at creating bad at capitalism, telling people <laughs> not to buy things. I well, I I like 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 the the main story engine deck has um 
I, I can I, I had a little calculator where I actually like figured out the, the, the math combinations. But I think it's something like in the area of, of I think the core deck is 12 billion and you get up to like 30 billion combinations when you add an expansion. I wanted the main deck to like just do everything you need it to do. The expansions yeah. are really cool for adding like flavor and being able to like season um, your prompts a certain Having way. guest writers and stuff, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and for having guest writers, yeah, it makes makes more room for guest writers. So yeah, I just, I, I like, but I like the core deck to do a lot. I like it to, to be reusable and add a lot of value and for that to be part of the design language, um, which yeah, is not particularly great for like selling people more copies of the one thing that does all the things but i think it does make it for like a, i think it's a good it's a good product it's a good yeah thing. definitely a lot better than some other companies <coughs> wizards in the coast <laughs> <laughs> um okay uh let's uh let's find out more about our little scavengers designer here so we're going to draw some secondary cues from the figures uh figure cards uh so background where they had a traumatic experience at a specific location um, an agenda where they want to establish an economic empire with a material. Instead of drawing material cards, we could use our link token set, which is a um, stretch goal. It's going to be added to every deck if we hit it at 450,000. Um, we could use little link tokens and just link this to the oil and cables. So rather mm. than drawing a new element, we can decide to reuse an existing element. Uh, a trait where uh, this um, designer's capture is inconsiderate of others' feelings. We're just creating Fadriel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A trait where there is skilled problem solver. Again, Fadriel is, is uh, you know, you may not like the solution, but it's effective usually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Does that card card? have another side too? Uh, the side is oh, a, okay. so all okay. of the cards, yeah, all of the primary card types are double sided in a way where they have the simple primary cues on the. Oh, what apostate. Why didn't we get apostate? <laughs> oh, yeah. I yeah, love a good, good, I love a good, love apostate. A good apostate. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get votes for uh, Trauma, um, Material Empire, um, Inconsiderate, or Problem Solver. And yeah, any of these, any of these read in, in an interesting way to you. With, chat, with what chat, if you, use tra if you choose Trauma, I will be so disappointed in you. <laughs> trauma, Trauma. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, like, I, I, I'm definitely, just in the interest of expanding a, a location, I'm a, a little bit attracted to a traumatic, the traumatic experience. In terms of what we've um, done so far, I do think the material, uh, the material empire, makes quite a bit of sense. I um, guess traumatic does would be really interesting if it goes back to he scavenged it and had a very traumatic experience when he that, scavenged it. That, like, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Is yeah, because yeah, it's, yeah. Because it's specifically In that location, case, I like it. It, it, it. Yeah, it's specifically location, which gives us a room to kind of like play what kind of trauma it was, and like there's a yeah. discovery there. There's a, there's an not exploration just, there. In his past, he had a trauma. Yeah, it, it, that's it, why it's he's not, it, now it's not, dark. Yeah, it, it's it's not exactly like oh, like my Disney parents are dead and now yeah. I'm sad. <laughs> um, like, oh, I found this plant that I thought was cool, but now it's I need to feed it dead people. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want this wasn't what I did, wanted to design, but now I guess I'm designing death. It's funny how that happens. Never, never know what. This it feels very um, freelance. The, 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 like, this you never know this, the thing that's going to become the thing that is your career accident. The, the, this live stream brought to you brought to you by Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we got votes for material here. Two votes for material. Um, if we want to do a little uh, a little method called the corner tuck, which is where if you have two adjacent prompts on a corner, you can use both of them by uh, tucking with the corner exposed. We could keep uh, the traumatic. Shit. Traumatic experience as well. We, we we just blew your mind. <laughs> yeah, corner check. Little advanced, little little pro tip here. Pro a tip story. A little today. advanced move. Yeah, um, I like I like it. Um, no, dude, this thing is so well designed. Thank you. I'm I'm proud of this. I'm proud. You of should this be proud machine. of it. This is very Absolutely. intuitive and cool. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, oh, speaking of which, Jordan, uh, I have your deck. They finished printing it, so I'm gonna send you your little alpha copy, which will be uh, so that you get a chance to get hands on before you do the writing. I'll mail that out to you uh, soon. Take that, chat nerds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason that we invited you on specifically to antagonize the, the chat with your early access to the deck. Um, okay, last uh, last cue here for our designer. Uh, a background where they denounced a. F oh, actually, sorry. Before we do this, let's quickly pull uh, that location. Um, here we go. So it's the location where they had a traumatic experience, um, a tower, a shipyard, a summit, or a waterfall. I like tower or shipyard. I, I always love a tower. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to go waterfall, especially with the crystalline structure. Uh, that would be a pretty cool, like visual scene to set with this, like 
petrified crystalline plant growing at the base of a waterfall and like perpetual dampness that is there's something yeah, cinematic like like, like like one of those like waterfall caves if, if, you're, if you're playing a video game and you know there's going to be a secret chest in there or there's not and then you just like have an extreme hatred in your heart for the designers why, why did they even why did they <laughs> yeah, even bother fucking, why is there even a fucking waterfall if there's not a chest <laughs> yeah I also like summit like the thing that these things could only grow at like high altitudes for some reason and they're very yeah. convenient to get to uh it's just funny for like this person's job is just very hard because of the amount of um hoofing that they have to do and I, I like shipyard too for like if their first experience with it wasn't in its like in native environment it was like if they like found it in a crate um, well, and like, like maybe this is like a part of a, a crash ship and it's actually like the ai for the ship but like yeah Ooh. it looks like a plant to this person and that and... is oh that is the twist to a D setting that i ran when i lived in halifax way back uh like 12 13 years ago um the only thing that survived so it was like one of these situations where like there was a high-tech society all the ships were in the air and crashed at the same time during a big calamity and it becomes a fantasy world uh as like this sort of um anti-science Clap. magic force is released but the only thing left over from the ships is the ai skeleton this like indestructible material that had little crystal seeds growing on it which were like the data port access points so there so they would keep finding these oddly angled what they were experiencing is trees, uh, little crystal plants um, that uh, they eventually, through like a combination of arcana and science, figured out were um, the the skeletons of uh, ancient crashed spaceships where the rest of it had like fallen apart and, and pulled away. Um, and it's just weirdly specific uh, to like a crystalline plant. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was just a weird blast for the past for me and the five people who experienced that setting 14 years ago. <laughs> and tower just makes me want to do the opposite immediately, like where you think you're going into a tower, but when you walk into it, you suddenly realize that you're going down into the earth when you thought you were going to go up. Ooh, an under tower. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like it. Sh sh shipyard, I, I do like what you just said about shipyard, especially it's like, like going back to like salt and crystalline structures. It what does, if the shipyard was like, behind a waterfall? It, <laughs> also, also good. It's, it's hey. like, like especially that. <laughs> well, that, that does make it very more ang a lot more ancient because it's like, well, how did that ship get there? It's and like, the waterfall like is coming off of a tower, you know, <laughs> that's on the summit of a mountain. Perfect. The, the, All right, we're gonna do the quad tech. Uh, it requires the, 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 physically yeah. stretching the car. Now show me how this works, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the um. The your scissors. now deck creator. Yeah, the deck the deck does not physically support this. We'll see if we can if we ever do an app. We'll see if we can add the quad tuck functionality. Don't you just want to design a car that it's, has like a little metal structure inside of it that has like expand? It, it, it's yeah. like when they add, it's like when they added the fourth razor razor to the blades. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Or um, if there's a way to do a, like a, a weird origami fold where like all of the words end up being visible. Um, okay, the well, let's count the pulls, here. It opens out. Waterfall, waterfall, summit, tower, shipyard. Um, so I think we'll go with waterfall. Um, I don't see any reason why the waterfall can't be, like it can't be a shipyard that's like near uh, a water flow. So it uh, seems like we have both for shipyard. Or, oh, no, we got a bonsai. I'm, I'm going backwards now. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so uh, and then this last uh, prompt for our figure. Um, a background where they denounced a former ally, um, an agenda where they want to revive a defunct faction, a trait where they're cowardly or shrewd, or a trait where they avoid high pressure situations. If we're going for plot, I think revive a defunct faction. And by defunct, yeah. I mean long dead for eons yeah. faction it would be good. I mean, but then I, I also love a cowardly I... character like so much. I, I kind of, I'm kind of enjoying cowardly and shrewd right now. Um, I and we we do not have enough edges left to corner check, unfortunately. Even so, like cowardly and shrewd in my mind, like he found this thing and it's dominating him, but he's like trying to figure out how to get out from under its thumb. Well, like, I, I, I yeah. I, I especially like the, the the interplay of cowardly and shrewd, where it's like yeah. cowardly, but like, like like you've got this like kind of like anger, but you're too too scared to do anything about it so you go off into the wilderness to scavenge some kind of secret thing that you can then weaponize to take out the people that wronged you in some way but you but, but that you don't actually just you're too afraid to confront them directly so you have to be shrewd go, about it yeah yeah all right so we've got votes for oh we've got two votes for um the ally one vote for revived uh, defunct faction um via soul's saved in the crystals to be downloaded into host bodies oh interesting uh rugged Dunk faction by literally like bringing back the people who used to be in it yeah um, that is a fun that is that's a fun what i was pitch. thinking yeah 
Um, but I think we've got two votes for the ally figure. Um, so uh, we, we have tried to sway democracy and the people have spoken and we're going to go with, uh, I love a good betrayal. Um, betrayal is such a good, uh, such a good, like literal, like, or not literal, but metaphorical story engine. Remember for, that you said that right. later, Peter. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's like, I got you something for your birthday. Guess what? It is? <laughs> oh no. Betrayal. <laughs> Does it come with a gift card? Mm -mm. It has uh, a receipt, though. It, it, do, it oh, okay. does, but it, it does, it. but it's already been used. Yeah. yeah, and you have to return it for a betrayal of, of greater or equal value. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, here we go. We're going to figure out who the uh, former ally is. Uh, are they a nurturer, a specialist, a captain, or a judge? I like nurturer because I like to make my betrayals as, as like, stab you in the heart as possible. Yeah. I I like specialist um, for designer. It basically, it kind of all makes it like another a former creative partner, yeah. As it were, so somebody with a very specific knowledge that had a falling out for for some reason. Oh, and yeah, I want I and I want them to feed their senpai to the plant. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, the betrayal has to be putting them in a plant, right? Yeah. Um, Put it, it in the plant. That, like, yeah. Oh, I also, but yeah, I do like nurture. I, I like that idea that this is someone who like uh, is kind hearted and trusted them. And it makes it so much more horrifying for the reader or the players when they find out that like, oh, like they did this to someone who is not only like their ally or their friend, but was just like a good person, like who didn't deserve it. Um, bad things happening to people who didn't deserve it. They did it, it to the fiction. little old lady who came by every day and gave them a, fr a free um, pastry on their yeah. way to market. And one day he's like, oh, come in. I want to give you something too. Well, I think the votes have come in for specialist. Um, so that's not to say that it can't be like a specialist baker who's just really good at pastries. <laughs> no, it's over. The dream is gone. The dream is gone. Chat <laughs> once again has destroyed my dreams. <laughs> tread Jordan carefully upon chat. my dreams, chat, because they're my dreams you tread upon. I love um, I love Jordan versus the chat. You started off by antagonizing them about your access to the alpha deck, and now they're getting back at you <laughs> by voting this, against this, this, everything. This is... Yeah, this is the betrayal in real time. Yeah, yeah betrayal in real time. <laughs> try, so yeah, try, try to um, promote something, that, an option that you don't want, so that they deke into the one. Yeah, that yeah. God, I sure hope we picked specialists. <laughs> <laughs> um, love it. Okay, so um, Eric, do you want to learn more about the specialists, the waterfall, or the cables and oil? I would love to learn more about the cables and oil. Let's do it. Um, pull so when a specialist and a waterfall love each other very, very much, much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they get very wet. <laughs> yeah. And they need something called lubrication. Um, uh, someone actually mentioned earlier using uh, that the oil might be a coolant for the crystal so they can process information faster, which is a thing that I really like. Um, I like that idea a lot. Okay. So we're going to name, uh, so interestingly, we can, we can apply this to, to cables or oil as the word that these are modifying. Um, but uh, we also don't have to literally use the main word on the card. Friendly. You can use, sorry, friendly, a friendly, <laughs> just a friendly little cable. Yeah. Don't mind where, don't mind which orifice it's creeping into slowly yeah. of its own volition. Friendly little cable. Don't score him; it'll hurt more. Um, <laughs> devoted, um, solitary, of the elements, sage, which I like. Oh, scaly gives us texture, which I don't like in a way that I, I, I love like. it. Um, of good intentions. Nah. <laughs> and then the crown. The crown cable or crowned oil. It is an interesting one too. I, I like yeah. crowned and scaly. Yeah. Scaly is the most immediately evocative to me. Yeah. Um, what, what's, what was on the other side? Uh, uh, so on the first side we had friendly, which I, yeah. I, I if, if you can't obviously corner tuck things on opposite sides of the card, but um, yeah. I like the idea that, that the designer calls it, okay, oh, it's just a friendly little cable. Like every time he's about to embed someone's soul in a crystal, um, he's just like really downplaying the like horrifying existential yeah. threat that this thing poses. Um, devoted, be solitary. be my scaly neighbor? Elements. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of the elements seems a little bit on the nose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that feels very much like a classic D and D item that you'd find in like like a, a pre third edition. Yeah, book. which is if you the... enjoy is cool. Yeah, but I do not. Yeah, all, <laughs> all, all choices are valid, right? It's all about what you want here. But yeah, we're dunking on your option. Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I think I like the idea of like friendly being a thing that we carry with us, but isn't the prompt. But I like the idea of going with the scaly. scaly yeah, I, I think I think scaly yeah. like like that that textural component, like especially like scaly oil. I, I don't know what it looks like, but somehow I can feel it and I don't like it. Yeah, yeah. It, looks, um, it looks like those things you see of like um magnets or ink being affected by magnets where it's like spiky and then not spiky. Right. With a, with a, yeah, yeah, a like sound aero, wave aero going fluids. through it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, uh, so this is, this is like 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 I went fishing a few weeks ago, and it's like when you're holding a fish, it's like they feel slimy and scaly, and like yeah. like all at the same time. It's a very unnerving texture. Yeah, the, the oil seeps between the scales. I love yeah. the description of the oil as nightmare fuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, yeah, this is cool. It's and it's giving us like cables. I often think of them that being like that ridged texture, where it's like a lot of ridges, and I like the idea that that it's a scaled cable instead. It's like a very unique texture that I don't think I've seen done before. For just, just gonna pull up to the nightmare station and fill up the tank with premium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> love it, love it. Um, okay, let's find out more about this material. So our oily, uh, scaly cables. Um, a background where they are linked to conspiracies about a faction. Um, they are, they have a synthetic origin as a background. Which you've um, already basically said, so. Yeah, yeah. And I usually ignore ones that, that just sort of confirm what we already know, like yeah. new information. A trait where it repels. See, see I, I actually, I actually was assuming this was still an organic plant, actually, that they were using, the designer was using it for something, but not that they had made the plant itself. And then a trait where it has a strong taste or smell, which is, I've, I was going to actually ask earlier, like, do we think that the, um, the oil has like, do, are we going to go like rancid or are we going to go sweet or something? Because it'd be um, fun to like, to, to like not go gross, make it yeah. something like, it's yeah. weirdly attractive that makes the grossness of it even i think a, a, a sweet sour tang of almost overripe fruit yeah yeah like you can see the fruit flies buzzing when you but smell it's, it but it's like right before it turns yeah i like that a lot well uh, it's coming in from the chat here oh repels a creature that's another one that i do like i do i always love the like seeing how organisms interact and this being as a bridge between two things in the same ecosystem is kind of cool uh, and especially if like the plant is trying to avoid um, getting stuck with like an animal soul because like it wants sentient souls, it needs to mm -hmm. be able to repel creatures to stop them from interacting with it. Um, that that would like like I think those two work very well together. Where it's like, well, like us us dumb humans can't keep away. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's very so alluring. It repels but, but the, but, non sentience like chat, but the so. the animals like look at us and it's like, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> it's it's like like are are you stupid? Like like that, that's the, <laughs> yeah. that's the that's the soul eating plant. Like why are you going over there? <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I, like the Humans, votes are coming right? in, and Tara, Tara called the play here. We're, this is a corner tech situation if I've ever seen one. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to scooch this down a little bit and scooch this down so that we can just fit um, in the top of the frame our creature. So what does it repel? Is it repelling a cephalopod? <laughs> oh, this could be an underwater... Um, Another more order. goddamn dragonflies. Dragonflies! <laughs> hey, that's two. There's one more. Uh, the Deities deck has the dragonflies and deities. That's what I mean by overloaded dragonflies. Um, let's, we can go for a hat trick, though, and pull in a deity at some point. Um, a tree or um, a boar? Cephalopod, dragonfly, tree, or boar? Tr tree <laughs> is actually interesting, where it's like this tree never grows. Or just like, like you what if you, no you other plants can grow near it? Yeah. That that said, I'm not like, like are we overloading on the plants? Like like do we go for I think we can do it because like if anything, it actually makes the plant more singular because like there's this creepy radius where like suddenly you're in the forest and then there's no plant life for like yep. a very yeah. visible radius and there's just this thing in the middle of the clearing that's like kind of organic, kind of not, and and you're just like what? Or it, or it repels the cephalopod that's inside of the brain of everyone in this society. Ooh, ooh, I like the idea of little cephalopod puppet masters. Um, I was recently reading a book on um, cephalopod intelligence and the origins of consciousness because cephalopods, their whole brain structure evolved so separately from ours back on the evolutionary tree. Like they're the only thing that has human-like levels of awareness and sentience, um, but that did not develop that along the same evolutionary pathway that we did. So it's like the closest thing to meeting a living alien is the way a cephalopod thinks. Um, so I really like the idea that uh, the creature like does not want or isn't designed to interact with this like other kind of intelligence. So it really is trying to keep those things away and like go for humans. And that this could be a water-based uh, organism could also be. So, so that's a good way. high level choice. But if you're making a choice that is good for designing like a setting, maybe like the tree would make more sense because that gives you in world storytelling moments to like be like you come into a clearing and why is there not makes you wonder why yeah. this thing is not close. Yeah, we, we, we have a good suggestion from from Thomas saying uh, it, it keeps trees away to make sure it gets sun. 
Yeah, in my head, I've been holding on to that cue about slow metabolism, and I'm wondering if this is like a slow, slow growing, slow ossifying plant. Um, and I just like, think the other really trees easy. are scared of it. <laughs> like that too. Leonard's <laughs> like, I don't, I don't hang out with that guy. No, nah, that, that guy's <laughs> fucking trouble. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, you tell do, him, Leonard. Let's do a tree. I think we had a we had a three way tie, and um, uh, we can we can t tie break this. Uh, I mean, I, I guess Leonard's dead. He, did, um, get, he it, did get he did get knocked off the thing. Oh, he got knocked, but then I think that I think that uh, Amaral was scooping dirt back. Okay, good, good. Yeah, good, yeah, yeah. I think we actually see him in the final montage in the background. Oh yeah, okay, his, yeah. Nice. His narration. <laughs> so yeah, don't worry. Leonard makes it. Uh, no, you know, without without spoiling too much, Leonard does make it. If if you're one of those people who um like like I will sometimes do for my wife, find out like does the dog die in this movie before we watch it? Uh, Leonard does not die in this movie. Leonard is okay. safe uh, right to the end of our again. That's our D and D one shot adventure that you can find on the lives tab. Unlike many YouTube. other things in this one shot, Leonard does. <laughs> Not die. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, beautiful. We've got we've got tree here, and then we're gonna do one more for this material. Um, a background where it was discovered by a notable figure, uh, which we kind of already have a little bit of a setup for. Background where a fortune's worth um, was. Oh, this is an example of why this is an alpha deck and it's a typo. A fortune's worth was lost in a wreck or crash. Mm. Lost is the missing word here. Um, your deck will have the same typo, Jordan. You can pen, pen, that, pen that in when it arrives. Um, trait, uh, more or less expensive alternative to another material. So there's like a, a cheaper version of this you can find on the market. Um, they, they, or, these are the budget souls. <laughs> yeah, budget souls. Uh, or a trait where there's phasing properties. Uh, in the current storyline on Dimension 20, um, uh, there's, uh, they're visiting the underworld and there's a situation where they need to get a high quality soul and they can't. So they're trying to get like a cheap crappy counterfeit soul and they ended up finding like um uh, a free hugs guy <laughs> as they're like he was all right like he didn't really <laughs> contribute to the world but it was very nice <laughs> he had a good heart. i like phasing properties yeah yeah especially because we're dealing with like um the metaphysical and like transubstantiation phasing yeah. phasing fits right i mean the the, the, the more or less expensive alternative is interesting too because then that could be like what is their use? Are they using these souls like drugs? You know, like, are you like mm. consuming someone's like whole life experience in one big like snort or huff from this plant? You know, yeah, I, I, I would kind of love to know if like people cultivate this. Like, like do they eat this thing? But like, if you scrape the crystals off, is there yeah. like good eat? Is there good eat? You just like rubbing, like, like, rubbing, like, rubbing your gums a little. Yeah, like, like I, I am. They use it like snuff. Yeah. Oh, and a little question from this is where uh, my Richard, brain goes. It's great. Joined us. Lore based <laughs> nicknames. What in the wild realms have I stumbled upon? Um, we're just doing a little uh, test drive of an expansion called the Namesakes expansion for um, a creative prompting deck called the Lore Masters deck. Um, so these uh, white cards with the gray text and little boxes are from the Namesakes expansions. All the other cards are from the main Lore Masters deck. And uh, yeah, the Lore Masters deck, you can come up with ideas for interlinked or lore connections between factions, figures, uh, events, locations, objects materials and creatures um and this expansion gives you unique nicknames that you apply to them and that's what we're uh, playing with where can moment. people find that is that something i can find in like back or something yeah it's a currently live on backer kids so funny that you should ask um and uh you can find that at story oh, slash lore, a little um, thing on the screen there um beautiful uh, so, yeah, sorry, we were talking about phasing properties that we might apply to our, um, we are currently working on the, the scaly cables and oil that grow out of this. Yeah, they phase into your body. Ooh, that is they, very they, 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 they become like ethereal on you and then they just sink into your flesh. Yeah. See, see, and I, then I, they I, become I, solid again once they're inside of you. I, a lot I, of I, for phasing. I, I was thinking like phasing transdimensionally. Oh, so it's like that's that's like, really good. Like, too. like sometimes they're yeah. in this world and sometimes they're not. Yep. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. Yeah, and uh, maybe our designer is like working on a way to um, be able to use them as a gateway to transfer themselves to like. Oh, maybe that's how you get to whatever other plane, right? You have to put yourself in the plant so that when it phases, it takes you. But it's like a very volatile way to plane shift. Um, yeah, I like I, that because I, I always loved like in the um, uh, what was the, the Hyperion series when they like would travel like faster than light, it would actually basically like just turn you into a puddle of bloody goo. And then you had to be remade on the other side of the travel. I love like, it. It's like, wow, terrifying. that's like, that's, that's quite a way to like faster than <laughs> yeah. light travel, you know, and you feel it every time too, you know, how long does it take to put you back together? Uh, I think, I think it was 
quit very quickly in that book series, but it'd be great if it was like months. Oh. <laughs> at, at that point, we saved might... ourselves years of travel, but now I have to be painfully put back It'd be together. Like 3D printed out of the yeah. goo soup. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. <clears throat> I, I love an inconvenient fast travel mechanic um, yeah. or like a terrifying or risky one. Uh, I know the, my first experience like with a really cool fast travel uh, that, that was like, oh, that's horrifying was the um, uh, the kind of like weird between space gateways in Wheel of Time. Um, Wheel of Time does a lot of Oh, yeah. I love the, the walking yeah. in the dark ways or whatever. Yeah, the dark ways. Where like I, I had like I had like the, the good nightmares from that. Oh, the first oh time yeah. I read it's it. so good and creepy that like and they never fully explain that what yeah. they are and leave room for wonder right like that's yeah why they also I... never fully explain what the fox face people were and yeah. stuff in that other tower dimension i'm like yeah yeah i yeah. know he died yeah. but still like come on yeah leave readers with questions is i think it's a good way to go i like oh, it, it is a great way to go because the fact that i'm upset about it means he succeeded <laughs> yeah you know yeah that's a good sign. You know what? I think uh, making someone feel strongly about something, even if exactly, yeah, is a good as a writer. The fact that I was so funny. fascinated by these hints that I like won it more. Yeah, is probably better than if he had ever told me what it was. Yeah, yeah, I I fully agree. Always leave them wanting more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I think we're going to do our last prompt here. Um, finish out this world. So, uh, let's vote between. Um, we can either uh, figure out what this waterfall is, is option one. And then option two is we just finished demoing the deities expansion for creating deities. Um, but we could pull a deity card and figure out another way to connect it to this main storyline um, and give it a name because the namesake deity. cards are designed deity. to pair with deities. Deity. All right. Well, it's one vote for deities. Uh, or three, I guess, because you chanted it three times. And uh, <laughs> I think, I, I'm I think very curious about the waterfall. I'm not going to lie. Deity. All right. So we got a tie. We got a tie. We have three votes from Jordan for deities. One vote for waterfall. ASMR the deity for us. You know, it's like deities are really good. Deities are cool, and, and you can you can come up with some. Really or you think they're really cool, toys. but then actually they're inside of you, and they're full of teeth and stuff. Oh, that's so many teeth. You won't even believe how many teeth. Um, all right, we have one vote for waterfall. One thing that I'm not sure if it's a vote or not for deity. Um, uh, the deity's the ancient, but the word deity's there, so we'll count it for deity. So that's a that's a tie so far. Um, two for deity, and I'll give it a couple more seconds. Again, there's this weird delay thing. I know that you're experiencing the time differently than than we are. Um, we live in your past. Um, we've been we've been phasing. Yeah. All right. I think we will go with deity then by by narrow margin. Um. So here we go. Uh, the deity cards are another card type that work much like the other primary card types, figures, and factions. Um, the only main difference is so, um, yeah, they're deities. All the cues to them are specific to what would make a god interesting or singular or, or motivated. Um, and uh, the uh, other thing that's very singular about them is that unlike other cards, which just have the word designer, a little thing that just kind of gets you thinking a certain way is all of the deity cues have the word the in front of them. So this isn't just any trickster. This is the going, trickster. Going back to the thing or yeah. <laughs> yeah, going yeah. back to names, it's like, like if you're the... You're the prime you're source of deal. this concept, yeah. yeah, basically. We have the trickster, the heretic. I mean, you know which one I want. <laughs> the cat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, doubt, no doubt vote for the, the heretic. Or the courier. Um, I always love a, a messenger god. I think I think Hermes is underrated. Um, I, I underrated. I'm actually feeling cat or courier. Those are um, heretic. Yeah. <laughs> I like courier. Out of if we're not picking heretic, I like courier. I also like I like an animal god too. Cat is definitely. I, I, I think courier makes sense with the phasing properties as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got right, and cat, it could be from cat. a society that has like and, you're talking about like so much high technology in the past that a simple like email program is now the god of couriers. And 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 now <laughs> and and ba and basically, yeah, the, the, the courier is we're, we're literally shutting shuttling souls with this plant. Yeah. So I, I do think the courier and, makes and, sense. And, and in the past, it was like a simple like mechanical thing that now is seen as the god because it's continued like the the main program was cut off, but all the appendages are still flapping around in our world, slowly dying. But to us, they seem like full of life and intent. Um, that is creepy and horrifying, but I think that the chat has spoken. I think we have three votes for cat, two for career. Of course, cat's going to win. Oh, no, no, no. Third, third for career, third for career. 
Uh, we have a tie. So um, uh, the courier cat. Let's side. <laughs> let's, let's side do this guy. C cats have phasing properties. Mind teleport around the house. That's what um, I wrote I, for. My, I wrote phasing cats for um for Spire. So oh, cool. They were uh, spelled K H A T cot. Cot. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're no pretty, one stopped me. We're pretty evenly, is just we're pretty evenly split on that chat, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, another uh, I mean, I think Flappy Doodles is obviously the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think that, that was Jesse naming yeah your um oh. uh severed flappy tentacle uh thing. But we had we had another vote for cat. That is the tiebreaker. We will we will honor um honor democracy. I mean, here. cat cats are adorable. So. I do love a cat. I also like the idea that like the um this crystalline plant and like this crystals growing on it that are almost like catnip to the cat. So like this cat deity will like come to Earth specifically to interact with and like knock mm -hmm. the crystals around. The tr the tree avoids these plants. The cats don't. <laughs> yeah, the cats are into it. The cat comes to this the tree. Cat. The cat comes to this tree to refill its lot its nine lives after it loses some. Oh, so actually, this could be fun because the cat could be like there are actually the deity is nine bodies. Like it does have literally nine lives that are, that it can extend itself through simultaneously. I, I recently did um, a Sicilian folklore horror inspired storyline set in a, like another island in my my homebrew D and D world, um, and I did a, a adventure based around La Strega and like witch folklore from from Sicily and southern nice. Italy. Nice. Um, and um, uh, this witch was. Uh, I don't think my wife is watching this, nor our friend Rachel, but in case you are, they're about to find some of this out. In the earmuffs! So yeah, earmuffs, <laughs> spoiler alert, if you're the two people who are part of this this little side story I've been running. Um, but um, So the, the witch was drowned by this nearby town uh, nine times. Uh, or th actually, I think I went with 13, because I thought like those are both creepy numbers, but 13 is four creepier than nine. Nine, but nine down is 13 the times, number, but it's cool. And every time she was drowned with her cat, and um, so there's 13 oh, no. cats that inhabit this ghost village um, called Pozzi Puzzolenti, which is the town of Stinking Wells. Um, and uh, so there's just these 13 cats, all of whom uh, look the same. And they were like, the, the cat was blinded by the town before it died. So there's these 13 eyeless cats wandering around. This is actually a warning to chat yeah. for yeah. animal cruelty. Well, they're still, the cat's still there. Cat's still alive, right? Um, cat came back very next day. And, uh, but I like the idea that it's this split consciousness across multiple bodies. Uh, and like, I think the cat is a really fun way to do that. Um, Why are the wells stinking, Peter? Because uh, all of them had a witch drowned in them. So they found okay. out that they needed the only way they could kill her was to keep digging new wells. I like so a they, good I like a good corpse well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because like yeah, they, they arrive in the town and they can smell like copper in the air. Um, but this like, and just a weird amount of wells dug throughout the town. Yeah. Like, why are there and, so and, many wells? And my favorite thing was they did and, most people just call them graves. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tube grave. This <laughs> tube is our grave. tube grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or like instead of waterbed, it's water grave. Yeah. Um, uh, but the thing that I had a lot of fun with was they did a lot of research ahead of time. Like they decided to do a lot of like lore digging and research before they went to this like remote town in the mountains. Uh, so they found out that there had been 13 wells dug. But when they get to the town, they can only see and find 12 of them. And it's because one of them was like a private well in the estate of the family that ran the town and is like under lock and key. Um, and and uh, so that one, there's just a body is staring up at the hole. Well, that's where like the that's where the, the body of the maestro of this like villa basically lived, um, and uh, yeah, it was I, I I thought it was a cool spoiling your stories, spoiling my own story, um, but it was a lot of fun, a really really fun little storyline to write. And so I like the idea of like this cat god is actually multiple cats. They have nine lives, and all of those cats are like out in the world and like interacting with things. And they all um, come to this plant and just like lick it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're all just a little little um, crowd of cats, just all chilling and noshing on the same weird, creepy oil cable crystal plant. All right, so we are going to nickname the cat. The ugly cat. The st is this stingy or stingy? I'm pretty sure I think it's, it's stingy. I think that's stingy. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel like you're a better writer than to have written stingy. <laughs> I, hey, hey, I can Wait a minute, you also goes. are the the go no yeah. guy. So like, yeah, or yeah. What, I snow, invented snow goes. Snow, 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 snow go. So. That's what I what I named the snowmobiles in the world of rhyme way. My favorite thing is to do high fantasy world building snow and go. then throw in a bunch of stupid elements. My yeah. favorite, one of my favorite examples of this was actually writing that um, Eric and I did on the song we've tapestry for Emberwind. There's a scene where you go to like the festival inventors and people are producing their inventions, and someone has just invented what is essentially just chewing gum. Um, yep. but they, this is again like, like the festival of inventors the scions are in a war with the rift keepers guild and here's a product that he names <laughs> chewing gunk chewing uh, this gunk. character yeah. is like do you want to buy some chewing gunk and i just love like a dumb name mixed in with high fantasy it's, it's and, and, and the funny thing is you know like there's a market for that because people don't know what don't know what it is yet 
Yeah, yeah. I love the Rift Keepers. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, Jordan. That, that was that was the other thing I wrote was like a short story for the as a Rift Keeper, like hit squad. Yeah, yeah. That was such a cool little unit. I think Caleb was the name of the character. One of the characters, yeah. Caleb yeah, Drask, yeah. I think. Caleb Drask, yeah. Um, I was trying to come up with. I don't do a lot of high fantasy, so I was trying to come up with like high fantasy names like Caleb Drask. Yeah. But well, uh, it, 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 yeah. I think you search the, that short story as the, the Hymnal of the Blood to Come. Was that the? Yeah. Yeah, Hymnal of the Blood to Come. If you Google that, you can find Jordan's story. It's a banger. It's so good. Uh, be ready for some body horror is, is the, the one, like, heads up I'll give you. <laughs> uh, right, sorry. I got distracted right in the middle of this. So, uh, the ugly cat, the stingy cat, the unspoiled cat, the sharp cat, the believer's cat, the stout cat, <gasps> the cat of broken limbs. That's my vote for, for uh, creepy, creepy cats. Um, and then the conquering cat. Ooh, I like the conquering cat too. I, I like the believer's cat. I like, like the cat. Does this cat. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is where like, if there's different names for people who are or are not uh, in worship of this creature or who do or do not affiliate themselves with it. The believer's cat is what the, like the cult of the cat call, call it. Yeah. Uh, and then everyone else. I also like sharp, cat. but in more of like keen or like, like it's the sharp cat, like the way they used to call someone like, like someone who was a witch, like she had like cunning. She was a cunning, right. or, you know, or, like or, 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 or card sharp. Yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or the, actually, the, I mean, I just like this. Uh, this is one of those names that I feel could be divisive, and some people will hate it, but I like it. The idea that the cat's name is just called like they're called cat sharp, or the cat's name is just sharp. Like just straight up, the, the, the name yeah. of the cat is sharp. I, 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 they call it the sharp cat. Yeah, is what I like. Yeah. The broken yeah. limbs would be a good horror creature, but yeah. I'm not sure if it's good for a deity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, well, I, I like unless, it unless, it's, unless it's unless yeah. it's unless it's causing the broken limbs, but e even oh. then, it, it doesn't feel like. I, I mean, because then I, I, I do like the idea of the, that that it's like multi jointed and it's like breaking as it comes at you. Yeah, that's what I was imagining. It, it, especially if there's nine of them. All right, we're broken nine, limbs, obviously. Yeah. Nine cats with broken limbs approaching you, and you're like, okay, yeah. well, I'm either all cracking die and crunching and then reforming this. as they come at you. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, chat, for supporting my, my free it, it, you, you, you know, like like on, on the last one, I think what Rocky was saying, so she, she was like, asked, why come, how come we can't just have nice prompts? Yeah, yeah. How come at the uh, end, we have, we'll, we'll be building an idyllic village, and then right at the end, we come in with a multi-broken-limbed Because, uh, be, because we are, you invited us to be Yeah, I was going to say, this, this is what, like, what I was going to say is, this is what happens when she's not here, is it just went full horror. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you need to invite a different writer started, if you want it to be nice. It, 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 start, it started bad, and it just kept getting worse. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Petting the cat is consequences of broken fingers. I like the idea that it's not that the cat like swipes you, but like literally when your hand enters its like distortion field. Oh, so what if it's not, what if the broken limbs aren't like cracked bones, but like it has this like weird visual distortion field where it's kind of like it's walking through a funhouse mirror all the time. So its mm -hmm. limbs are like bending and curving. And when your like hand goes into pet it or touch it, you see all your fingers like break. And that's the visual effect. Of I, it. I, I like that. And, and fr frankly, we already have tree somewhere else on this lore web. We never said that it has to be human or, or, oh. or animal oh. limbs. What if yeah. the cat's like home world is this like tree where all the limbs have been broken off? Um, and uh, yeah, and it's like this this like storm shattered tree that it lives in. There's something about the visual there that I like. Cats don't have bones. Yeah, don't look it up. It's definitely uh, cats. <laughs> cats have more bones than humans. Both of these statements are simultaneously true. Cat, cats are always acquiring more bones too. <laughs> yeah, another fact. We're yeah. just we're just we're just popping off cat cat facts here. Cats right, are born cats are born with no bones, but by the end of their lifetime they have a lot of bones. Some would say too many bones. Yeah, some would say those too people many are bones. dog people, of course. Yeah, those people are heretics. So yeah. all right, here we go. Let's the more some... bones your cat of your village has, the more blessed you are. I think that's a good rule. I like that. Uh, it gives you a reason to feed it bones. But let's give some traits to our cat deity here. A uh, background where they're worshipped by only one faction. Uh, they have an agenda to defeat another deity. They have a domain. So their domain as a deity is life or healing, which is interesting for broken bones, right? Like that could suddenly recontextualize it towards this is a cat of, uh, or broken limbs. This is a cat that's about like healing. It, it, it actually zigs pretty a lot with what we've done so far where it's all been about, about been death but the cat's actually it's like i just want you all to live yeah or, or the cat is like what's that thing where like you that syndrome where you like hurt someone so you can you can nurse them back to health oh monk is that munchauser, munchauser syndrome yeah it's a munchauser, munchauser syndrome where, like where yeah. it breaks you so it can heal you yeah 
Oh, that's a creepy. That's that. So we do we want to go deeper into the creep, or do I mean, we I want said, to? Well, I, well, I like that, but I also like the defeat another deity. But I want it to be slightly edited to, to defeat all other deities. <laughs> that's a very cat attitude, and I yeah, like it. it wants to kill also, every other deity. Also, streak and, would and, come packaged with that yeah. too. <laughs> Like, like uh, yeah, for 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 me, it's like the um uh, the life or healing. It's like I like the idea that the cat is more benevolent than the than the, the designer. It's the designer has warped mm, the yeah. message of of the deity that he's chosen to tamper with. Yeah. That's the nice one to go with. It it is probably yeah. the nice one. To, well, <laughs> yeah. it, it depends how you depends how the how you feel about the designer, really. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact: out of the average body is enough bones to build an entire skeleton. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> I mean, if you're lazy, it can only build one skeleton. I mean, like yeah. you should probably shoot it, for it, more it, than one skeleton. Yeah, if you're very inventive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody uh, can build a human skeleton if you're inventive enough. <laughs> Some would say that we all already have. <laughs> all right, we got to vote for life or healing. We've got to vote Two. for defeating another uh, deity or all deities. Um, depending on how we choose to read it. Um, the other reason I like the another deity is it lets us pull more deity cards, which is just fun to give them some face time. Um, another vote for defeat, which uh, puts us in the majority for defeat. So yeah, let's go ahead with defeat another deity. And by defeat, we mean devour. Yeah, I think I think it's got to be devour. Or maybe it like brings, maybe there's like one deity it's not going to defeat and it brings the other dead deities and leaves it on the doorstep of that deity as a show that dominates. <laughs> <laughs> Or when you get to its like lair, it's just like a, a nest of dead deity carcasses that it's nesting inside of. Oh, that's a creepy image. I like that. I like that a lot. And that could be and that that could be the broken. And then and the nine cats are slithering in and out of the carcasses, in and out of the corpses. Yeah, okay. So so while we're just getting real creepy here, another pitch. Um like a cat, the the cat deity plays with its kills. So the mm -hmm. broken limbs are it like stops them from running. It has these not dead gods that are like can't die because it's playing with yeah. them, but it's like broken their ability to escape or fight back. And like and, and it does a little hunting where it guys. watches them and then goes up and yeah, yeah. So if we want to go full horror, 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 that I think is a really fun direction to go. So we're gonna pull another deity card to fill that in. And it's it's like acolytes are like these people who have to like keep the day keep the deities from dumb dying like just barely worshiping them, worshiping them enough to keep them alive and then like not letting them get to full power yeah i like i like that a lot so i think let's go with all deities because i think that's a fun thing but let's focus on whoever its main nemesis is here so this is going to be the chimera the arch fey the navigator or the meddler the arch fey i like i like fucking uh, with some fey i i'm going navigator so like a spaceship uh, a cartographer or something like that. Um, so, so, so somebody who wants to map the world as opposed to like, like, like I don't know. Like, like, I mean, there's only one navigator, and they it had yeah. a flight. You know, the flight <laughs> yeah. Shout out to all the kids born in the era to whom that movie is relevant, <laughs> <laughs> myself included. Probably I, nobody. I, I, nobody in chat probably. <laughs> I, I was born to that era, but I haven't even seen that movie, so I can't, I can't even. See, I, I I like the idea of the meddler because like I like the, the there's a more like human shaped god that like a cat just likes to screw with stuff like you know tangle threads and this and cat's like no tables. fuck off that's my thing yeah <laughs> that's what i do i do love the idea of this image of this cat like oh nice soul plant you got on the counter here sure it would be a shame if someone yeah <laughs> uh yeah I, I i for me i think it's like because no, like navigator is like very much like a function of like there's a direction to get somewhere there's like order there's um linearity and if you're if your sworn enemy is a navigator Who's like trying to get people from point A to point B, and you're just like causing chaos. I that, love what someone in enemy. chat says. Yeah, um, the navigator is in this world's like basically their their Karen, you know, the navigator of souls. Yeah. And this cat deity wants the souls and the plant, so it wants to kill the deity that is keep bringing order to where souls go. Yeah, that that's that. There's something oppositional to navigation. I yeah. think in this in this lore we've created, so I think that's when that that's why that one jumps out to me. Yeah, so let's let's talk navigator because I think we have a tie in the chat between that and Arch Archfey, but this can be a Fey navigator, right? Like this, if this is a mm -hmm. transplaner creature, that makes a ton of sense that it's like give, a, give it some big ears. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> give, us, give us some poison elf ears. Yeah, yeah. Or I, I like um, I, I'm vibing this thing as like a big moth type creature. Oh, um, yeah. Mo mo moths are like they they I think they're capable of like migration. Like they can they can travel. Mo long moths can have big ears too. That's true. That's true. Damn. Big fuzzy, some big fuzzy moth ears. 
Um, but yeah, we definitely want to make the cosplay game on this this character strong. So I think getting them some features that you can <laughs> stick on before a convention is a good good call. I, I see I see moths all the time. <laughs> what Rag. do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah, give me give me context. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I, uh, I got nothing. <laughs> All right. Um, let's find out a little bit more about this cat. Um, uh, is is it the spirit of a specific location? So a localized spirit. Um, does it have an agenda to create the ascendancy of their chosen one? And we draw a figure character to find out who their chosen one is. Is their domain creation, invention, or innovation? No. Or I mean, this was pretty on the nose. Playful with mortals. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the the chosen ones seems like it plays right into our designer, seeing as that it seems like they're kind of working it together on this. Um, definitely it's playful fun. with mortals. That is that is on the yeah. nose. I, I like I kind of like the idea that this like god killing cat, um, the the doorstep that it leaves the like maimed uh, god corpses on is like the mortal world. So like mortals will wake up one day and just like oh there's like a dead god in the yard. Um, yeah. And it's the cat way of, cat's way of saying, like, I have been protecting you. You should be aware of, like, this service that I've been doing you. Um, kind of a very Max Gladstone, like, then, like, the, what do we the, do? How, how do we deal with the course of a god that's here now? Is this, yeah. like, is this oh, like, um, like nuclear waste question. kind of thing, you know? Like, yeah, or is it, it's like when you see a beached whale and, like, children, like, exactly. blow it up. Do we, like, how do we deal with a beached whale? Or does the love? corpses of these gods have, like, special properties, almost like plutonium or something, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Or we can start harvesting these dead god bodies and become part of our technology. Yeah, and there's something again. About... That's a very Max Gladstone thing there. But th there's Not something me. about that and the um the, the souls and the plants, where like if you can get a god soul in there, or if like god bodies are the fertilizer that the plants grow out of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's something you can do with that. Maybe sure. these crystal lime plants only grow out of where god bodies have been or yeah. are. I really I, I really like that idea. Um, I, I think that's a lot of fun. And, you, uh, you come into a field of these plants, and you're like, "Fuck!" There was a dead god here at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, like, as a as for those in the know in the world, and like, not everybody knows that. For some people, it's just like, "Oh, there's that weird plant that trees don't grow near." Yeah, you're um, like, no, this, else, is, like, this oh. is where a, a god was slaughtered." Yeah, yeah, and like that's you. You can't get that quality of fertilizer at like the local <laughs> home and garden center. Like that's a. That, that, yeah, that you, you go you go to Hexen Garden, and then like they just don't they look at you weird. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so let's go with Playful with Mortals. Um, and then we'll do uh, our last cue of this draw before we, uh, we wrap things up here. Um, let's draw. I just want to make sure it's one that we didn't draw last time. Did we do this? Yeah, we did this one already. So I'm going to leave that one out. Did that in the last live stream. Oh, this is a fun one. All right. Um, the cat is the lover of another deity. As a background, bringing it back to horny. Yeah, there we go. Bring it home. Bring it home, friends. Bring it home An agenda where they're trying to establish a temple in a location. Um, uh, a domain. Uh, so their, their domain is people who make or use a specific type of object, um, or a trait where they have a mortal champion or mouthpiece. Let me draw a figure card to figure out who that is. I like the lover of another deity, but that deity is dead. Ooh. <laughs> in what sense are we using the word lover here? <laughs> um, That's the part we leave up to the imagination of the, yeah. of the, of the player. I also love your, you're trying to slip in a little bit of Baldur's Gate here, too, with uh, the, the, cat, oh. the cat lover. Um, the, animal, the animal form lover. I was thinking that like it was like in its lair, there's like a big throne, and there's like a dead thing on it, and it always like talks to it. Oh, okay. Kind of like a Wilson the Volleyball. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 but with a huge corpse. Well, we weakened at Bernie's. Yeah. With a, but like a huge, like mini limbed corpse that has been like all like mummified and sinewed and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And who knows? It, maybe the cat actually hears it talk to it. Because of the ancient cat dog war, it's a it's a dog corpse, and it's actually weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little Bernie's mountain dog pun for you. Um, we got votes. We got votes. Um, lover, um, love your deity. Don't love your deity, um, which I don't think counts as a vote. Uh, so lover, mortal champion. Um, oh, clarifying that the vote is for lover. Uh, mortal champion, that's two and two. People who make yarn, catnip, or other materials made from fibers or plants. Ooh, that's a fun one. Um, but we're tied two and two for mortal champion or for lover. But I think lover, we have a lover. Lover. Come on, chat. We'll do the call right that a thing. Tie we'll call that a tiebreaker, which means we get to pull one more card, actually, because we're going to find out uh, who the other deity is, and we'll just finish off with that. 
So we're going to pull one more deity card here. I mean, we can't pull any more, right, after this, because they don't fit on the screen. <laughs> well, and, and we are we're, we're out of our allotted time. I've been trying to keep, I, I keep, these these things keep sprawling because I have so much fun. Um, but I lock myself in a room with no air conditioning for these. And I have like, I just, a shirt gets sacrificed on the altar of my sweat every time we run a live stream. <laughs> That's um, like the timer is like, if it completely sticks to you, yeah, once, then once you, you can then see it's, the, it's over. It, it, yeah. it's, it's like watching a Robin Williams comedy special. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he just gets progressively more <laughs> manic and sweaty. <laughs> yeah, 100%. All right, so oh, we pulled that one last time, so we'll do a new one. <laughs> Interesting. We already had this called out. The dog is on here. Um, <laughs> are they in love with the Watcher? The dog. <gasps> the Unraveler, like a yarn thing. Come on, it's got to be the Unraveler. Um, or the Redeemer. I, I think the dog is too perfect. <laughs> Little cat, little cat, dog friendship. You know, what? interspecies friendships. Um, oh, we're not if, talking. If BuzzFeed just... taught me anything, it's that if you want to go viral, interspecies friendship is the way to go. We're not talking friendship here, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah, friendship. Yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> friends make, like, listen to endless love in the dark. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna make like historians ignoring queer relationships throughout history and say that they were really close friends. <laughs> yeah, that, they, and they were roommates. <laughs> they were roommates. They were close roommates and close friends. Uh, who lived together all their lives, and none of them ever, and were perpetual bachelors. <laughs> yeah, confirmed bachelors. Confirmed bachelors. <laughs> um, oh, unraveler of the threads of fate. Come on, yeah, I like I, I like that too. But yeah, the dog is the dog is very fitting. Um, the dog is a, a great option. Uh, so that's two, three for dog, three for dog, one for unraveler. It's the dog. The dog and the cat are special friends. Um, that's the term that we use around uh, grandma. And uh, that completes our little prompt here. So let's just do a little review because I think we've had a lot of fun today and I want to remember that fun. We started off with um, the plant of the ancients, this sort of crystalline bodied plant uh, that naturally produces um, these oiled cables. Um, and is the, uh, one of them was a pet of a notable figure who was a designer. Uh, that designer was trying to establish an economic empire using the cables and oil and plant materials. Um, they had a traumatic experience at a waterfall, which we never really got into, but Eric, <laughs> we can always take that one offline. Um, they were the, their nickname was the scavengers designer. And I think it's because they used a lot of like things that they just found as they were cobbling together their, their artificery. Um, and uh, they have a background where they denounced a former ally who's a specialist who I think that they probably stored inside one of these soul crystals. Um, sad to say. Uh, the scaly oil cables uh, have phasing properties. And we talked about that it's possibly a way to that people, who, if they're willing to run the risk of storing themselves in the plant, they can phase between planes. Um, and uh, specifically, any other plant life won't grow near these things. So there's always that creepy circle around them where nothing else grows. And they have a... Um, Really strong taste or smell. What do we end up going with, Jordan? You had a great idea for this. What do we end up going for the smell? Oh, overripe fruit. Yep. Yeah, yeah, like almost about super ripe fruit. The sour, sweet tang. Yeah, love that, love that. And then uh, we finished off by adding to the mix here our little cat, uh, the cat of broken limbs, who's playful with mortals, um, is trying to defeat all other deities and just leaves. Um, uh, god corpses scattered around the mortal world. In particular, they're in a rivalry with the Navigator, who is has their own way of working with the transubstantiation or the transmigration of souls. Um, and uh, they are special friends with a dog deity, the dog. Um, and I love it. I think this is a ton of fun. Um, so this has been looking at the namesakes expansion. Oh, we have a question. Do you from... have four of those slip cases on hand? No, I don't actually. Have okay, I thought it'd be cool to see yet. what it would look like if they were all slipped. I would also like that. Uh, but yeah, the, because sleeves are a much more involved process, it's hard to get um, uh, preprint proofs done of them. Okay. Uh, yeah, because the manufacturing process from them is pretty dedicated and involved and expensive. Um, but at some point, I do want to mock up um, like a GIF, which, which flickers between with and without. So you yeah. can kind of see the difference that it makes for, for level of focus. Um, yeah, but this has been the Namesakes expansion. If you liked it, feel free to share this link with folks. Let them know about um, storyenginedeck.com slash lore, which redirects to our backer kit page. We're live on backer kit right now. We just passed the $350,000 stretch goal. The deck has expanded to 300 cards. Um, and that's going to mean so many options for your creating and lore and world building. And I love it. Um, and before... none of them will be creepy, I bet. Yeah, none, none of them, them will be that. creepy because we definitely didn't hire the creepiest horror writer we know to come in and creep up our deck i, I um, mean everything's a creepy if you interpret it right yeah um speaking <laughs> of a coward <laughs> uh, speaking of uh creepy uh creepy 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 jordan where can the people find you and what are you working on right now um you can find me at jordan or a lot of times at at hottest singles on twitter 
where I tweet too much. Um, I also design t-shirts, which is at voidmerch.net. And I have a Patreon where I send out creepy ephemera in the mail to you that you just get. And then all your relatives are like, why did you get this bloody tooth in the mail? And you're like, mind your business. And then <laughs> I'm sure it all end up fine. But yeah, I have writings here and there. You can find it all on my website. Awesome. And Eric, where can the people find you and what are you working on? Uh, they, they, they can find me uh, on the story engine and also right now um, with uh, uh, working with Nomnivore Games on Emberwind. Oh, cool. Uh, still. So, uh, yeah, that, 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 those, are the, those are the two big ones. Um, story, story engine and, and Emberwind. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, Eric runs the socials. So at Story Engine Deck on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I think we're now on Threads. Um, uh, you can find we, we are. there. Yeah, yep. uh, and we'll find out what that is, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where you can find Eric. Uh, Eric and I will also be at Gen Con um, as the Story Engine Deck uh, along with Maroki. So uh, we'll, we'll post announcements with our table members soon, so you can find us. You got to come to Gen Con sometime, Jordan. You got to do it. When I win the lot, when I win the lot, when I win the lottery, it's, I'll it's, go. It's on, gonna, I'm going. It's going to be my vacation. first one. So uh, we'll, we'll, it's going to we'll be overwhelming. I've been once. It's just, it's just I can't afford to go all the time. But um, yeah, I've never had more expensive hotels in my life. Yeah, um, it's, it's an expensive. Even the, like, the, we stayed, the, in, the, we stayed the in a travel hub of Indianapolis, Indiana. We stayed in a, uh, what do they call them, Airbnb, and it was still pretty not super ex- cheap. Yeah, yeah. But there was a hole in our floor that I looked, I standing up, looked through, and it went to the basement where they had a red light bulb lighting the whole room. And there was a man like working on something over a table. I shit you not. So this is not this is not micro. This is this is not micro fiction. This was happening. So I just looked around the room and I picked up a box of Kleenex and just set it over the hole. I was like, that solved that problem, I think. Um, and a little comment here from Richard. Um, uh, Emberwind, I've heard of that. My group expressed interest in it, but I know nothing of it. Um, it's got a pretty good free starters kit that you can download off the website for getting into the quick play rules, building characters. Uh, and it's a really fun... Actually, I, I first experienced Emberwind before it was released. I met the main designer, Derek Chung, at uh, Gen Con to do a play test. I'd met him before in person just talking about it, but it was the first time I got to send. And the mechanics were so good. Like The combat was so fun and kinetic. Um, and the storytelling system, it is a system that can be run in a GM optional way. So you can have the storyline and run itself and you as a party can all be players and a, a branching kind of choosable path adventure and um i just highly recommend checking out uh, emberwind if one of the ways you want to find your way into that is by checking out the lore story that jordan wrote that's the hymnal of the blood to come yeah um, there, there are there are a bunch of lore stories on the website they're just like like short short uh short fiction standalone um that flesh out come with some of the origins and backstories of the characters that are in their, our campaigns and a yeah. lot of monster, a lot of monster fiction. Yeah, the two, <laughs> the two, the two ones I did like connect to each other too. So like, the the hymnal, the blood to come connects to the blood mother story. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, what was the? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the title of that one. I I'm I'm looking that. it up right now. Yeah. Um, on my jordanshavi.com bibliography page. Let's see. It was called "A Thing of Ancient Blood and Cunning." Right. Yeah. Was the yeah, yeah. Uh, was the actual blood mother that. one. And then she's the antagonist in the other story, basically. Yeah. yeah. So go check that out. There's lots of fun lore links um, throughout the Emberwind universe. And uh, Emberwind is the tabletop RPG whose art library we have rated and licensed for the box art for um, uh, Lore Master's deck and many of its expansions. So uh, beautiful, beautiful artwork. Great art team. Um, we good, good friends with them. We like them. You can find them at emberwindgame.com. Um, wonderful. Well, this has been a wonderful, a wonderful time. Thank you all for showing up in the live stream. Thank you to our guests, Jordan and Eric. Um, Eric will be joining me for the next one of these on Friday. So you can come watch us play around with the bridge expansions and see how this deck, uh, how the Lore Master deck plugs into the Story Engine deck and Deck of Worlds. Um, but we will leave you with a message to have fun, be creative, and uh, make some creepy, too many teeth uh, deities in your spare time. It becomes highly recommended. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. <laughs>